Farzi, I got to ask, and it's maybe a question that should be asked more. How are you doing? How are you doing right now? Hey, you know what, Polper? Thanks for asking, because that's a question you rarely ask during the season. You don't yeah. care if your head's on my shoulder while you're sleeping. You don't care if you're snoring in the bed. You don't care about anything. And oh. now you're asking. And you know what? I want you to know I appreciate it. Good. And I'm doing okay. Yeah. I want to answer honestly, because that's how I believe in conducting myself. Okay. And you know how in quote unquote normal times, we'd be in the thick of an Ontario hockey league season right now. Yes. Probably be using Don Cameron's favorite phrase. If the playoffs were to start today, because things would start to be lining up, we'd be wondering, Mm -hmm. and we'd also be, probably pretty done with sitting on buses and traveling to places that are far away. Amen. I miss it. I miss it to the point that I feel as though I'm a little bit bored. So it's not even so much missing the games. It's just missing the routine of being busier right now. And I, I recognize even in saying it, that being bored right now is kind of a privilege, right? Because I have a place to be bored and I have something that I'm missing and all that different stuff. But I'm so overall, hey, I can't complain. But if I were to start picking some nits here, boy, oh boy, am I getting a wee bit bored on the weekends. You know what I do on the weekends? I walk my dogs. That's yeah. what I do on the weekend. And that's fun, isn't it? Do you ever take them to the dog park? There's that dog park at the odd. You're not far from the odd. Do you ever take them over there? No, I'm not a fan of the dog parks. It's not no. the dog park's fault. It's mine because if I let my dog off a leash, it is never coming back to me. Gotcha. Ever. So yeah. I blame the trainer completely. Yeah. Our, our uh, exercise. And then it, I'm hoping it's a little bit good for me too, is just to take walks two a day. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing two walks a day on the weekends. Well, you're looking, looking like you're losing some weight. So maybe it's working. Maybe I should start walking my dog more. Maybe that's what I, I don't know, but I'm getting, how about you? I'm getting a little bored. How about yeah. you? Oh, buddy with, with this lockdown, obviously, like you said, it's, you know, a privilege to be bored. I'm still employed, but my job is mostly done over email and texting and maybe the odd phone call. Cause I can't really go to any bars right now and sell beer. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still busy. If anyone at Molson's listening, I'm very busy, a uh, 40 hour work week. It is busy. Um, but yes, I'm getting, uh, very bored of just sitting in my house. Um, I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast yet, but the other day, a couple of weeks ago, um, the way it works, I stay up late. I'm a night owl always have, have been, as you know, um, I like to stay up late. Uh, my girlfriend goes to bed early. She wakes up early with the dog. So I'm up late with him. She wakes up early. So he's not in his crate too long overnight anyway um she got a furbo for christmas uh so it's a camera that can watch the dog and spit out treats well it's in our living room so i woke up the other day at 10 10 30 maybe in bed you know grabbed the cell phone looking at it i'm like what's the point of even like getting up right now like i'm just gonna go from the bed to the couch you know so i'm answering email sending texts on my phone i walk downstairs like quarter to 12 i get a text from her because she got a notification furbo uh senses a human and she goes, oh, nice of you to get out of bed. I'm like, <laughs> well, what's the point of getting out of bed right now? Like I can do all my work from bed, you know, besides to let the dog out for a pee or go for a walk. Really, I'm, I said to her the other day, I made my way through Parks and Recreation on Netflix in about a week or two. Um, binge binge watch that. And I'm like, I need another show to watch. Like I'm just done. And even then I'm like, I don't even want to watch another show. I want to do something. I I'm craving to just go out to a bar and have a beer with a buddy, like so bad. And this winter, the snow we've gotten lately, it's not helping. I don't even want to go outside and walk the dog. It's freezing cold. What was it? Minus 11 the other day. I know we shouldn't complain. My friend lives up in the Yukon and she said it was minus 44 the other day with a 51 wind chill. But I'm just like this. I'm so done with this, man. And I feel like everybody's getting to that point. Isn't it funny? The complete 180, right? Because Again, in that normal time, we'd be at the point of the season where we're just, we're kind of ready to be done the season. We're kind of ready to have our weekends back or whatever the case may be. And now I'm like, I'm never going to take for granted that level of busyness again, ever. Bring it on, please. The sooner, the better. It was very weird the way it all ended too. Like obviously both of us working full-time jobs, doing the Ranger stuff on the road. It's a very hectic time during the season for both of us. And then all of a sudden it just gets cut right up for Monday and everything's done. And now, you know, you have to stay at home and it's like, what is going on? 
we got cut after broadcasting a game. Yeah. In Guelph. And as we signed off the broadcast that night, we've probably mentioned it on the pod before. That's when the NBA pressed pause and we got the news release from the old Elmira Maple Syrup Festival said canceled, canceled due to COVID March the 11th. And interestingly, and this can tie into something else we're going to mention in passing anyway, that was a 6-5 win for the Rangers in Guelph that night, game number 63 of the 2019-2020 season. Greg Morellis, the co-captain, three goals, three assists in on every Ranger goal in that 6-5 win. And he has just been named the ECHL's Player of the Month with the what? Greenville Swamp Monsters? Uh, no, it's, it's Swamp Rabbits, I believe. Swamp Rabbits. Rabbits, yes, thank you. Yeah, I had a book here with all the stats that I ran down last week, but I don't know where I put it. Um, we were talking about it, and he was I think he was leading the league in penalty minutes with like 25. And the first thing I said is what, was he dogging it on the back check? Because that's what you would expect with the Greg Morales type picking up enough penalty minutes to be leading the team. It was 28 penalty minutes and he got one 10 minute game misconduct for flicking the puck into the crowd, which I thought was pretty funny given the history that the Rangers have with that penalty. Um, He got 10 and two for that one. Um, but no, I, I took a look. There were three roughing penalties and a boarding penalty and three interference with only one hold. And that's, I think, with the style of hockey Greg plays and when he's most successful, he's in your face. He's physical. I'll take those a boarding and a couple roughing penalties for sure. Swamp Rabbits, another famous Swamp Rabbit alum. I haven't looked this up. I'm going off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure when I say so. Carter Sandlack. So Carter's ah. dad, Jim, a.k.a. House, former guest on this podcast. Go back and check it out if you want to. But Carter now making his way as a referee and was just out at the World Juniors over Christmas as one of the main referees at the tournament. So there you go. Um, Real quick, we didn't talk about this, but I saw something online the other day. We're We're recording this after the Super Bowl. We won't get into the football talks and Brady and all that kind of stuff. But Super Bowl snacks, you have to start one you have to bench one and you have to cut one wings, nachos, pizza. Okay. Pizza's cut. Pizza's cut. Well, because it's a Super Bowl snack. Yeah, for sure. And I'm starting the wings. So I guess the nachos get benched. That was pretty easy for me. That was easier than I thought it was going to be. Cause I, really? listen, I got my feed on during the game. Believe you me. Does your answer change if it's just snacks in general and we don't concentrate it on being the Super Bowl day? Oh. See, I think if... Yeah, like if probably. talking for the rest of your life. See, I don't look at... Pizza's a meal. That's not a snack, is well, it? Well, yeah, I just called them snacks. I'm just food. Yeah, I get it. Fair enough. Because the other two, I obviously could eat as a meal too. But uh, yeah, it, it probably does. Like I'm a big nachos guy and I might have a hard time choosing between the nachos and the chicken wings for the rest of my days. I'm probably going to lean towards chicken wings because nachos are always good for like the first six or seven mouthfuls. Right. But then the Mm. cheese gets a little dried up and you know, but boy, oh boy, right out of the oven, nice and crispy. Look out, baby. See, I'm more of like a later nacho guy. I want it when it's all just a disaster in there. No That's way. Where, yeah. That's the bread and butter. There's just so much stuff everywhere. The cheese is ever like you pick up one. It's got like eight attached. <laughs> yeah. That's the best stuff. Well, that's in this case, the next time we finally get back out on the road together and we have an overnighter, we're going to do nachos. I'll start the plate. You can yeah. finish it. It's going to be perfect. perfect. How did we not figure this out before? I don't know. We really should have <laughs> for the record. I'm starting pizza benching chicken wings which breaks my heart to say because i love chicken wings and nachos are garbage so really well they're not garbage i shouldn't say that because i do enjoy nachos like i said but compared to chicken wings and pizza i mean it's not even close yeah see i don't think of pizza as anything i eat during a game pizza's like just it gets its own place in the mount rushmore of snack foods it really is in the mount rushmore it's my go-to all the time like when my girlfriend first moved in she said like you eat a lot of pizza (laughs) I'm like, thank you. Maybe that's why I'm the size I am. Pizza is a mainstay in media rooms around the league. I'm pretty sure, well, in Mississauga, that's about all you get. There must be some kind of crazy deal with pizza pizza out there. I don't know if it's league-wide. Yeah. Uh, We usually get pizza in Sarnia as well. 
anyway, uh, think of the media rooms, which makes me think of some of our colleagues. And we should we should mention a few of the guys that we're not going to be seeing, at least a couple we won't be seeing, and somebody else that just had himself a pretty good little oh, weekend yeah. getting from the O to the show. But the first up was uh, Dom Hennig, former play-by-play guy with the... I say former because he has left the Flint Firebirds as their play-by-play and director of communications to join the Central Collegiate Hockey Association in the NCAA, director of strategic communications and brand advancement is Dominic Hennig. Quitter. Right? What a a quitter. Leaving Flint for D1 NCAA. Uh, Good for him. We mentioned him uh, on a previous podcast about him leaving. And then um, when Flint loses their voice on uh, radio and television um the radio voice of the erie otters leaves too aaron cooney heading off to the american hockey league we talked about the weather holy cow cooney did you ever make a smart choice what an forget upgrade those, eh forget those eerie winters he's heading to san diego with the gulls of the american hockey league director of communication and broadcasting uh great for him we used to talk to jay mckee all the time about uh, aaron and his unique call mixing in obscure uh mostly uh early 90s 80s rap lyrics after a goal but i think he stretched it out to all genres of music but i definitely concentrated more on the rap game and i can just imagine some of the tunes tunes uh cooney's rocking as he drove out to san diego in a u-haul also a former guest on our podcast we had interviewed him on the occasion of his 500th OHL game. So yeah, he loads up the U-Haul and he, he shared a picture online. There he is in the snow leaving Erie and well, not quite next stop, but eventual stop is going to be San Diego. Again, huge upgrade. McLovin. And McLovin. Which, McLovin. If you know McLovin, and I know you do, that is honestly, that's Cooney. Like yeah. they're doppelgangers for sure. Big time. And then of course, Victor Finley, who uh, does some uh, Mississauga Steelheads games, gets the call to the show the other day. He's like two years out of doing Ryerson Rams hockey. Yeah. We see him in Mississauga here. Well, we only go there the one time, but yeah, he does the occasional game in the O. And next thing you know, he's doing Sens Habs from the Bell Center. Okay. Uh, with uh, Jamie McLennan noodles and listening to his call. And obviously on Twitter, there's a, a lot of people that follow Victor as well. I do as well. And he, he sounded great. Some of the clips that were put online, it was blacked out here, so I couldn't watch it, but Sounded great. Didn't seem nervous at all. And it's got to be pretty nerve wracking when you go from the O to the show um, in a Canadian market to boot. And you're alongside a guy who used to play the game in Jamie McLennan. And then there's us. Yeah. And we're sitting here saying, when can we go back to Sudbury again? I'll all take right. It, there we- <laughs> I'll take it. I got to say, Popper, I'm, I'm, I'm liking the, the T-shirt under the jacket look today. You've, you've, you've stepped it up a notch this week. Well, I told, I told you, it got me thinking the other week uh, when we, or last week when we were recording this podcast, this interview you're about to hear, um, you know, as a f- another media member comes on, it's like, you're always in your suit jacket because we normally record after your show, which is uh, simulcast on television. But I feel like I should maybe up my wardrobe game. I don't really know. I l- used to think like, you know, me in a hoodie at home and a backwards hat or a t-shirt, whatever I was wearing, it would kind of give the guests a little um a little leeway if they wanted to come on uh with a suit jacket and a collar well then okay far as he's wearing that too if they wanted to come on in a hoodie and you know paint stained track pants then okay you know hope he's a little underdressed so kind of it didn't make them feel inferior if you will um but now i just thought you know what i'm gonna start throwing on the sport coat maybe see if i can uh, give myself some motivation because i can't button it up that maybe I'll get on the exercise bike I bought on Marketplace last week for $200 that I still have yet to ride. I'll tell you what, every piece of home <laughs> exercise equipment, why didn't you ask me first? It becomes a place to hang clothing. That's all that happens to it. You got clothes hanging off the handlebars yet? No, if I'm, <laughs> you're going to laugh. And people who know me will understand this as being very true and not surprising at all. Um, when I bought it, I put it in the back of the car came home and my girlfriend and I were leaving. So I just left it. When you walk into my place, there's like a little uh, area for you to take off your boots and whatnot. And then you walk into the kitchen um, and there's kind of like a dead space on your right. Cause there's a beam that comes down. So there's not really much there. We have the, the dog bowl and whatnot. Um, so I set the bike there just so we could put the dog in the car and away we go. And that was 
two weekends ago now and the bike, the bike is moved. still there yeah okay. <laughs> i haven't even brought it downstairs to where it's gonna go that's you talk about how we're doing at the start of this podcast that's where i'm at where i have two baskets of folded laundry here for a week that i come down and pick out of to put on my wardrobe that day that i haven't carried upstairs and i have a bike upstairs that i haven't brought downstairs so so far covid chris is winning step one get it into the house you're half uh, no you're a third of the way there step two yeah. will be getting it into its ultimate resting place step three we'll be riding it. We'll check in on your three-step progress in the weeks ahead. The worst the worst part, this is the second stationary bike I've had during COVID. The first one, my brother owns a gym and he lent me one. Um, and his partner even said, oh, I said, thanks a lot for doing this, you know, uh, Nexus and Elmira, free plug. And uh, Luke said, oh, actually, you're actually doing me a favor. I don't have to come into the gym now every week and ride it for a little bit because if I don't, the battery dies. Well, it was about a month into COVID when I realized, oh, the battery's dead in my basement because I hadn't ridden it. <laughs> so it stayed there for about six months before um, once things opened up initially, Luke's like, hey, I need that bike back. And I'm like, you know, the battery's dead. So I've gained 20 pounds. Because <laughs> the battery died. That's the only reason. Uh, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. If you want a free plug on the OHL Stories podcast, send us an email farwell and pope at gmail.com look up popey on twitter at underscore chris pope or i am at farwell underscore ohl free plugs for now the first one's always free you know how this goes deal and then we can set up a nice little sponsorship where we give you some mentions during the week we'll even play a little advertisement if you want you mentioned that our guest Tanners. this week is a fellow broadcaster chanters would be a good one they'd get you even more sport jackets like Come that on, mark uh, a former, bro or not, yeah, he's not a former broadcaster. He's a former OHL broadcaster, but still in the broadcasting game. And I, I'm just going to be perfectly honest again here. Uh, I, I fanboy a bit about this guy just because I had the opportunity to work with him for a couple of years at Sportsnet 590, the fan in Toronto, and witness up close just what he's capable of. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And I just think I, I love his style on the air because there's no real rhyme or rhythm to it. He just goes and he can go in so many different directions because he's so smart. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time working with him and it was a blast from where I'm sitting to get this guy on the podcast this week. Yeah. I, I used to listen to him all the time. And as you mentioned, extremely intelligent and a guy that um, isn't scared to voice his opinion, whether it's going to ruffle feathers or not. So we're in for a bit of a ride today, I think. Yeah, it usually is. Uh, got his start. He was the inaugural voice of the Saginaw spirit. Spent a few years down in Saginaw, then took a job with the Windsor Spitfires. Uh, then, well, at that time, he was with AM640. Then he went to the good side, Rogers, to the Fan 590, where Farwell used to carry his lunch. Yep, pretty uh, much. At, at 640, uh, the incomparable Greg Brady. A man who is probably, I mean, I think about this from the radio industry perspective, Greg. I remember when there were all these rumors that Greg Brady was coming from Toronto or from Detroit Sports Radio to Toronto to take over Leafs Lunch on AM640. And here's a big name in sports radio. You've got decades experience in Toronto, but you come by hockey generally and the OHL specifically very honestly hailing from the pride of, is it you or Scott Moyer who's on the sign of Hilderton? I can't remember which. That's a good question. We both went to Oxbow Elementary School. Um, uh, I'm older than Scott. I know you find that hard to believe uh, looking at me. The Olympics age you. All that travel to, you know, Pyeongchang and, uh, and, and Seoul, that's, that, that can age a figure skater. You know, having to look at Tessa Virtue every day, like just the lines, uh, the, the lines and the crow's feet you got to deal with uh, thinking about that, you know, picking her up in the air and throwing her. So, um, yeah, Ilderton, Ontario is about west of northwest of London by about 20 minutes. But Scott is easily um, Ilderton's most famous um, resident. I'd love to consider that I'm top 10 in a, in a hamlet of 400 people and probably declining. Um I went to Medway High School and the only other, and but so did Scott, the other famous alumni from Medway High School is one Peter Pocklington, believe it or not. 
former owner of the Edmonton Oilers, obviously, and uh, and beloved in Edmonton, really, from the summer of 1988 on, I think. <laughs> That's not a bad trade. They won the damn Stanley Cup two years later. Like, people forget that with the Gretzky trade. There's a statue, right, of Pocklington right beside the one of Wayne or something? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm at the grocery store the other day, one of the few places I go, and this guy p- says to the cashier and makes mention of the fact that Wayne Gretzky turns 60. And he goes, Gretzky's keeping a low profile now. He's married to that uh, famous actress. And I, I wanted to stop him. I go, she's not, I don't think we could, like, I think he thought the guy married Meryl Streep or somebody, <laughs> Amber Bullock. I'm like, Janet Jones, it's a stretch. Like, if you want to say she's an ex-actress, if you want to count American Anthem as her crowning glory, if that's her Sophie's Choice or Deer Hunter, then great. But I'm like, he didn't, you know, he knew Gretzky was 60, but really didn't know much about Wayne's personal life going back. But that's okay. He doesn't have. He must have read an article somewhere that said former famous actress, Janet Jones. Yes, it's got to be that. Anyway, I know you want to talk lots, Mike, about Janet Jones, and now we've accomplished it. Thank goodness. So the important stuff is taken care of. I got a quick, sorry, Mike, I got a quick question just on that note. Like going day to day, Braids, is it? Uh, is it good, nice knowing that no matter what you do day to day, that Peter Pocklington will always, you know, underneath you, you, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. He's all people are going to talk about negatively from your hometown. I feel like, well, I, you know, and, and Mike's seen me, uh, we'll walk the line on uh, social media, something I'm considering giving up. I may give it up during this uh, podcast today. You don't walk the line that much on social, I, do you? But, but I thought, you know, Peter Pocklington never, you know, never really had a, a bad tweet or I think there's a lot of, felony arrests that could transpire uh, with me that could put me in more disgrace than Peter Pocklington. But I, yeah, I'm on the safe side. Me and Scott Moyer on the safe side of, um, you know, uh, Ilderton area. So Ilderton is near Arva and Arva is near London and Arva is North London. And uh, you're right to go to say uh, in my very um, young days, a London Knights game, um, the London Gardens, soon to become the London Ice House, was way on the other side of the universe. Like it was, it's probably an hour drive really from our driveway to get to the parking lot. Um, and then depending on the potholes in the London Ice House parking lot, <laughs> it took a good half hour to navigate those and then get uh, and and then get out. But yeah, the Knights, I was so happy when the Knights the first year I started doing OHL games was the first year of the John Labatt Center. Um, so that was a great, great change for everybody to uh, road broadcasters and, and, you know, London area residents to get to go there uh, instead of going out to the gardens. Nobody missed. Uh, there wasn't a lot of nostalgia for the old London ice house, put it that way. I think they lost the entire 95 nights team in one of those potholes. Didn't they? Is that the- <laughs> <laughs> Including the broadcaster, Mike Stubbs. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a copy. That's a, that's a decoy walking around now with the with the emphatic uh, voice. It's a body double. Yeah. And, and as a former roommate of Mike Stubbs, I have stories that like, again, talk about your separate podcast. There's an entire, we were only roommates for about three or four months. And then he met the love of his life and he, he ditched me after about three or four months. He quit Fanshawe, supposed to go to Fanshawe, quits Fanshawe to take the 1995-96 Knights uh, play-by-play job which someone had vacated. And then, um, and so he quits Fanshawe. So I don't have him at school anymore. Then he, then he decides to move in with this girl, but he's, you know, still married to that girl 23 years later. So he did something, something reasonably right, which, uh, which, you know, I, I envy, I, I admire. What were I, your first impressions when you heard those uh, vocal pipes? Well, we were, we were at in campus radio together at CHRW. So he was sort of, um, we were kind of, I, it, I can say this, I think we were kind of, um, we got to be the stars of the show. That was the really cool thing as sports broadcasters. Cause we were just there uh, a lot and we were willing to put the reps in. Um, and so he was, you know, he was the hockey broadcaster for the Western Mustangs from 94 on. And I started doing play by play really with, um, with Western football in 94, they had an unbeaten Vanier cup winning season, my first year. And so they would have been like, you know, seven and zero, and then uh, twelve and zero. They beat Saskatchewan at when the Vanier Cup was when first moved from to um, to then Sky Dome. It was a big deal then to be able to go. There might have been 33,000 people there, and I think we can all concur. Like then it was, you know, O, you know, OUA, CIAU, and and now with U Sports, I think even pre pandemic, it, it didn't quite. I don't understand it really. It, it's not quite had the. You guys would know. 
it's not quite had the significance university sports championships do like when they would be on national TV and, and all over the place. And that's not to denigrate it, but it's just, I guess we have access to so many more, including the OHL. Like you can, the fact you can see every OHL game on your, on your cable or online, you've been able to do that for a good 15, 16 years. Um, it's changed content a little bit, but those were, those were really fun times. Yeah. Stubbs was, Stubbs was the guy, in uh, college, I always aspired uh, to, I, I think we're very different broad. He, he is a very, I wouldn't say he's by the book, but he can, he can stick to a script. And as Mike's seen me operate, the scripts don't mean very much to me. So I've always <laughs> admired Mike's ability, Stubbs' ability to stick, stick, you know, stick the landing. And I think he looks at me and goes, wow, you're a bit of a wacky ad libber and I don't know what's coming next. So uh, we complement each other well. He's he's one of my lifelong friends. Great guy. And now we're back working in the same company, so we can go on each other's shows, and that's been so so much fun. You talk about starting with some play by play football, and I want to come around to hockey because, of course, your OHL experience was with a franchise that had relocated from North Bay, and we'll get to that story in Saginaw in just a moment. But I, I brought up Ilderton initially because you mentioned the London Knights essentially, and we all know how the London Knights are regarded in the OHL these days. It's London and everybody else and everybody loves to hate London. But as a kid, your formative years for a guy that got into professional sports talk radio, uh, you were, you were kind of cutting your teeth in the OHL with some really big names coming through that Knights organization, going to see them at the old gardens. Yeah. First, first game I went to, I might've been five or six years old. Um, and, uh, uh, Pat, you know, Pat Riggins playing goal. Um, I think Rob Ramage, uh, it's either, I, I want to say Rob Ramage or Brad Marsh. I don't know if their paths crossed and if they missed each other it was only by a year or so. Um, but I remember those two guys as defensemen and then late seventies, Dino Cicerelli was a big, big deal, uh, in London to go see him. He was putting goals in and then the famous story, how he broke his leg, uh, going into the draft year. Uh, and didn't get drafted. And then the North Stars decided, uh, you know, to take a chance on him. And next thing you know, I think I'm in third grade. And that's that's the year of the Islanders really gr- grabbing dominance in the NHL from the Canadians. The Oilers were still a couple years away. And Minnesota played Calgary in a semifinal. And Dino, it felt like, was a rookie and would score a goal in every single one of those games. In fact, they knocked off the Canadians. That's really the, 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 the starting point of it, is the Canadians won four straight cups. And Minnesota was the first team to beat them. They beat them in a quarterfinal when you still had sort of one versus 16 and two versus 15 after they expanded out. And then the next year, I think the Oilers swept Montreal and it was sort of the end of the old, you know, Lafleur, Robinson, uh, you know, Ganey, Shut, LaPointe, uh, Montreal Canadiens. But yeah, Dino was a massive, massive deal. And then closer to high school, um, late in elementary school, Dave Simpson, Craig's older brother, was a massively uh, big name as a London Knight and uh, and was, you know, Canadian Junior Player of the Year. And we all thought that was great when we'd go see him play. And, and he got drafted by the New York Islanders. But I remember even thinking then when I'm like 11 years old, that's not great for Dave Simpson to go to the New York Islanders in 1982. Whose job is he taking eventually? And, uh, and I think Simpson kind of said, he's like, I just, you know, and I think this happens sometimes in football. I've interviewed athletes who say I've had so much fun playing college football. And then I get to the pros and it's not as fun. It it really is a business at that point. And, you know, Dave, it's sort of like us with broadcasting. Like I'm always surprised some people kind of dip in and out of radio or they're newspaper guys that want to do radio or TV guys reading a teleprompter. I've just always wanted to do radio. I've never wanted to do anything else. Never wanted to be a writer, never wanted to, you know, uh, anchor and uh, anchor a sports cast on television. And Dave wanted to just do other things besides being a hockey player. So yeah, from, and then you met when I mentioned the John Labatt center opening from Dave Simpson, almost an, until I want to say like maybe Rick Nash, there really wasn't a star player in London for a lot of those lean years, that team that Mike Stubbs started doing the broadcast for, I think is still the worst OHL team in history. I want to say they were three sixty three and two or some variation of that when Doug Terry owned the team before the hunters took over it, shockingly awful, like shockingly terrible. And I, I did some play by play, Mike, I, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to left me off the hook. I did some play by play for some bad OHL teams. We never went three, six. It felt like some nights we were about to go three. We were on pace for three sixty three and two, but we never actually got there in those first few years in Saginaw. So proud. So proud. We didn't. 
when you were going to those games at London Gardens and the London Ice House, that was a barn, man. Like fans were crazy back then. If I remember correctly, you used to be able to just walk down from your like seat in the stands right onto the bench if you wanted to. Do you remember any crazy times that you were there as a kid going, holy cow, what am I watching? I, I don't, nothing got too out of hand. And I'm, I'm pretty sure um, the only bench clearing brawls, once they started the global games uh, with Jack Miller doing them on TV, like sort of Cooper all era, uh, 82, 83, and we were all wearing Cooper alls playing minor hockey. It's interesting because I honestly had this theory that the players knew they were on global. So that was the best time for a bench clearing brawl. They didn't want to do it on a random Friday night. <laughs> When none, like none of these games were on TV, as you guys know, they yeah. like cable access was not doing um, junior hockey games for the better part of my existence. So global really that was your only chance you could be like, well, I think, you know, Dan Quinn's in Belleville. So the, I only got one shot to see him. It was a little like Major League Baseball, where there was that Saturday game of the week. And if you didn't see that game, you weren't seeing, you know, Ryan Sandberg or you weren't seeing uh you know, Mike Scott pitch for the Houston Astros, because uh, as we all know, we kind of grow up in that American League universe of, of uh, for baseball. We got Detroit and Toronto, you get Cleveland, right? WUAB, those games on Channel 43. But but other than the Expos, you wouldn't see much National League play. So, I, you know, Chris, I never saw anything crazy. I will tell you a, a quick story that a guy named Adam Clayton who was a, who who is black was playing I want to say for Belleville might have been the Ni- the Niagara Falls Flyers before they became the Hamilton Steelhawks and I don't know the words that were getting said uh, I would recognize the n-word if I heard it but my dad left the seat next to me to go down about seven rows closer to the ice and tell a guy to stop it with the racial slurs I remember that like my dad was a history teacher we grew up in a very you know, liberal household. And I say that because that's the most afraid you can be that your dad's going to get in a, in a, not just in a fight in a public place, but your dad's going to lose that fight. This was a big sort of burly guy. And I don't, I, again, I don't know the words. I just watched a feature on Ted Nolan on W5 hmm. when Nolan would talk about the abuse he would get. And, and he said, I, I'd heard words that I didn't even know existed when we went into, uh, you know, when, when he was playing in Kenora, I think tier two, and they'd go even across Northern Ontario or places into Quebec. And, uh, and so that was the one end. And the guy stopped, uh, I think out of embarrassment, but you know, we've all been at those sporting events in the stands where, you know, one guy's heckling a little bit too much. And, uh, and I think the heckling has changed for the most part where there's just, there's not a fine line. There's a really wide line that everybody should know what the line is. It's not fine. And, uh, and, and he must've been crossing it, but I remember being, you know, my dad's still, still with me at, uh, uh, you know, at 76. So I remember being, you know, really proud that he did that. And, um, it, it was a great lesson. Cause as we all know, the sort of, some of the chanting and some of the, I, I always wrestled with that in the OHL when, you know, 16 year olds would get booed and you, you know, you'd be, you'd have fans yelling at other 17, 18 year olds, like in Detroit, we would talk about that with whether, you know, booing a, a college quarterback or chanting for the backup to come in, you know, are they boys or are they men? Like you kind of know what you're signing up for when you're playing quarterback at the university of Michigan in front of 110,000 people. But I always thought about that with the OHL, do all these kids getting in at 15, 16, know, know that they're going to, you know, be get, really getting it from a, from a fired up greased up crowd on a Friday night with 6,000 people, you know, screaming for blood. I don't think they screamed quite for blood like they did in the old days, Chris, but they sure did in the eighties and nineties. So you're calling some university football, your buddy, Mike Stubbs abandons you for the love of his life, takes the London nice job and you end up in Detroit sports radio. And then early two thousands, I think it's Oh, one ish, but the rumors start and rumors are very (laughs) poorly kept or the, the rumors are great. The secrets are poorly kept in the OHL, but North Bay might be moving and there might be a team coming not too far from where you are in Detroit to join the Ontario Hockey League. What what was the process for you to end up as the first ever voice of the Saginaw spirit? Yeah, I, I got to Detroit uh, end of 98, um, pretty much right out of school. I worked for a little bit at 980 in uh, in London, um, CFPL. Um, but, uh, but it wasn't, you know, uh, Detroit actually, I, I'd had a work visa um, in the mix for a while. And I, I, my first job was in Windsor, and I knew I wasn't going to stay there uh, too long. Um, but it was it was a it was a great first job, as you guys know. Those first jobs out of college and journalism school, 
there's a little less of a farm system now than there used to be, but that's just how it would work. You would, I, I had classmates go to Yellowknife. Um, I have a great friend named, named John Bell who uh, worked at Global for a long time and he was a year ahead of me. He, his first job was in Swift Current. Uh, and he just packed his car and drove out there. So Windsor wasn't so bad. And I made a lot of connections across the river, just going to Detroit sporting events, going to, going to Michigan games. The year Charles Woodson won the Heisman, they, you know, mailed to CKLW a, you know, the, the press pass for every single game. Uh, and I'm like, this is amazing. Like I'm going to go to things that you're just never sure when you're a kid, like you're, you're never sure what you're going to get to do when you're 10, 11 years old, you can have a list, but it's pretty hard. Um, you need good fortunate circumstances and some breaks to, to hit a lot of that stuff on the list. And I was, and then I get to Detroit late 98, the work visa comes through right before Christmas. Um, and I start there pretty much right from 99 on four months later, I'm, I'm in, um, I go to the NCAA tournament in March in Milwaukee for a, a top seed Michigan state team. They didn't win the national championship that year. That's the Mateen Cleves Morris Peterson group, but they won the national championship the next year uh, in Indianapolis. So I got to be there for that, but they said, well, you know, you know, hockey better than uh, our other anchors and reporters. So you're going on the road. So there I am traveling with the Red Wings in the playoffs. Now I'm making like 28 grand a year, honestly, like I'm like, you know, pushing nickels together, but there I am flying to, you know, Anaheim and staying at the double tree hotel where the team is and it's it what you know getting up and and driving a rental car to Santa Monica Pier so I can go for a run in the morning like it, it just was so inexplicable to me but that stuff kept going and I, I traveled with the Lions for a couple of years on the beat reporting for radio and traveled with the Red Wings for a couple of years a few years actually but play by play was something that I missed and uh and so yeah you're right that that North Bay rumor starts to percolate i'd gone to some plymouth whalers games because where where i lived was uh was pretty close to where where the whalers played at CompuWare sports arena um and the idea of going to saginaw um you know i i had not getting married I, I started living with my girlfriend that became my wife in the summer of 2000 we talk about it and um you know she was always busy on weekends too because she was covering high school she's a sports reporter with the globe and mail rachel brady and she was covering high school football, college football, um, you know, having to work a lot on weekends. So I thought, well, you know, we don't have any kids. We're not married yet. This feels like a commitment that I could make. Now, Saginaw is 80, 75, 80 miles away from where we lived in um, at first Northville, Michigan, and then Livonia, Michigan. So that's that's a big commitment driving wise. And as you guys know, the weather in, in December, January, February is is concerning and you got to make sure you're not late. Um, and I've, Mike, I've been late before for things. I know you're <laughs> no, not, not you. Know, really. <laughs> so, um, so I remember reaching out to the general manager at the time coming from North Bay. And I think he was dealing with uh, a lot of stuff was a guy named Costa Papista. So he was North Bay's GM. He later was working with Flint, as you guys would know, um, in, in a weird circumstance there with the owners, um, with the, with, uh, the Rolf guy, I'll call him, uh, when, when Plymouth moved to Flint. But, uh, and Costa seemed like, uh, you know, he was, he was, it was out of nowhere. He didn't know me. Luckily, the owner of the spirit, uh, did. Well, we lose him. I think so. I'm still here. Are you? Yeah. Oh, bounce back. Braids, if you can hear us, we can't hear you. See if he pops back. Oh, oh! I think I got you now. There, there we he go. is. You got us now. Should I pick up somewhere? Yeah, you were just talking yeah, right about ab the, the owner of Saginaw, our good friend Dick. Okay. Yeah, we went to Flint. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so Dick Garber is the owner of Saginaw Spirit, and he had heard me a little bit in Detroit. I was doing the nine to noon show by that point, um, starting in middle of two thousand one and still traveling with the Red Wings in the playoffs. I would take that time and do the show, you know, even from the West Coast, wherever I was, or in Denver, I got, got to do those Red Wings Avalanche series. Like this, amazing to go to Denver in May and, you know, be at Western Conference Finals games. Like I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, first year was at the old McNichol Arena and then the Pepsi Center um, was the next year in 2000. Anyway, um, 
So Dick had heard my stuff and was a big, big, especially Lions fan. He's a big Detroit sports fan. And I think he probably nudged Costa into bringing me on to the crew. Costa had wanted to bring a, a gentleman you guys are fam really familiar with, Lee Cunningham, who'd been in North Bay, but Lee couldn't get a proper work visa to work in the States at that particular time. Uh, he eventually did because he worked for the Spirit after me. As you know, Mike, um, you know, I did six years with the Spirit and then was so impossible to replace. Really, it took them about five tries before they got Joey Batan Batano, right? Like, yeah, it, it took like they were, they were asking and misses. The, yeah, they were asking yeah. the Zamboni driver if he could do 20 games. <laughs> um, so really, you know, and Joey hasn't I don't think has reached my my game level, but he will. He's a great broadcaster. But it took them, you know, sometimes it takes you some time uh you know like i had a lot of roommates after mike stubbs the love of my life left but uh you know eventually you, you keep looking to replace perfection and it's just impossible so um so yeah uh it's funny two weeks before the season started costa calls me and says like lee lee can't do it so instead of doing color you're going to do play by play and um and we were off to the races and uh and saginaw was about to start in a market that um, as you guys know, and I'm sure all the viewers would know, really rich in hockey history with the Gears and the IHL and, you know, Ed Belfour had played there and uh, people remembered a lot of the glorious years of, you know, Saginaw Gears against the Toledo Gold Diggers or the, you know, Muskegon or the Flint Generals. Um, it was very, very Slapshot-esque era. And, uh, and so how would they respond to a sort of more more sanitized product, I suppose, still, it still can be a rough product at times in, in 68 games of the OHL. And that was the fall of O2. How did they react to that? Um, they were in, they were in from the get go. I think Saginaw did something that was really interesting, Chris, in that they didn't give their tickets away. And there's two different ways to go when you're a young team and, and the Detroit Vipers, I can tell you in the market where I was, would just pay the, you know, something called papering the house. They would give, t give tickets away at car washes and gas stations and drop them off and, uh, you know, at elementary schools and just hope your goal then is to get people in the building so that they'll buy merchandise and they'll buy food and they'll pay 10 bucks for parking for a car. And the spirit decided not to do that because they wanted their tickets to be valuable because, you know, it's, it's like a lot of things online, right? If you're, if you're getting music online, if you're getting, remember how we all used to read every newspaper was available online, like the newspaper industry really, really botched, you know, here, we'll give you everything for free for a bunch of years in a row. Now we want you to pay for it. Well, that's, you know, we're, we're getting there and music, we would do the same thing. Napster, Kazaa, like, like, you know, let's take music for free. Oh, now you want me to pay for it? Okay. Like, you know, there's some hesitancy in the market. And I think the spirit didn't want to wait to sort of you know, give it away and then ask people to, 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 you know, try it before you buy it. No, they wanted people buying in, but, but I think that, that they did it. They did a lot with game day ops that were really, a lot of things that were really smart, a lot of promotional things. And I really do think they treated it like, like minor league baseball. And I even think in the league, a lot of the stuff you see that every team doing now at the intermissions, um, Saginaw was kind of doing from the beginning. They were really, really clever in 02 to say, we got to give you an experience. Like the hockey game just isn't enough. And I know all three of us probably go to arenas sometimes and you're like, well, I don't need music there. And I don't need a big promotion on the intermissions and I don't need this and that. Remember, this is all before everybody's got a cell phone and they're staring at it and flicking through it and taking video. So I think they thought in 2002, 2003, how are we going to keep people's attention? Now the team was not very good. And I think early days, that's, that's a tough thing to explain to new fans, new noobs, if you will, that the way that Saginaw was going to get better in the long term was to take the team from North Bay. Uh, and I know it's something Kitchener, honestly, Kitchener and London and Windsor now, these teams are like, you know, uh, like college football, like Alabama, LSU and, uh, and Auburn. They don't have to do that. Like you don't, you don't have to take a recruiting class off. But if you're building through the draft, I think fans were a little disillusioned early on that, you know, they saw really good players uh, all of a sudden traded five weeks into the season and then eight weeks into the season, then a huge pouring of, of veteran players that they started to really like, and they're all gone at the deadline and there's all these kids playing, but that's just how you do it. Um, when you're uh, when you're a younger team now, it didn't happen. You know, I, I don't, it didn't translate because of, of, I think some, some dysfunction within the franchise. I think they needed to, to settle on, you know, management and, and coaching getting, you know, firmly established. There was a lot of in and out 
in that respect in those first few years um, that I did the games where they, they didn't make the playoffs for the first four seasons. And that was not, that was not part of the playbook. Um, but, but the, the methodology was right in that you got to get bad before you get good in the OHL sometimes. When did you see it start to level out? When did it seem to you, Greg, that it clicked for Saginaw as an organization? Um, Bob Mancini got hired to be the GM. He was a, he was a scout with the Oilers, uh, and he, uh, got hired within close to the end of the second year. And I think, um, my recollection is then Bob and I got to talk a lot that summer. It's weird because the G, you know, you get nervous a little bit radios like this, right? You, you've got a boss and then all of a sudden you've got a new boss. Like Mike, we had a great boss in Don Collins who let us do our morning show at the fan and, and really, you know, I don't think tried to tinker too much with you, me, and Jim for three years there and the entire lineup, right? Um, Jeff Blair and Tim and Sid and Bob McCown, he just sat there and, and you know, let, you know, hire, hire good people to do the work and leave it alone. And so you worry when you're going, the boss that hires you and likes you and Costa hired me and liked me gets fired. And then there's a new GM coming in. You're a little nervous, but um, I'd say Bob and I got on we were tighter, much tighter, not, not to anything to do with Costa, but Costa was just a little more guarded. Bob would, would, you know, come at me for feedback and Bob would sometimes, sometimes I'd be driving because of work circumstances uh, and not taking the bus or I'd want to go see my parents in London. So I'd be driving on a trip and uh, he would, you know, he'd want to ride in my car so he could make phone calls, <laughs> trying to trade half the team after some games. <laughs> So I'm hearing them go back and forth. It was a little like Jonah Hill being in the office with uh, with Brad Pitt and Moneyball. I'm getting instantaneous, you know, experience. And we build a real great bond of trust. So Bob had a great vision for what the team could be. He was very media friendly. Um, we would do, and, and that's the other thing Saginaw did, I think a lot of people do now. And Mike, I know you've done it a ton with Kitchener, is you'd go in before the game into this, into this you know, sort of hall, like a banquet hall get on stage and you'd preview the game with, uh, with the, he was a GM and head coach for most of his time there. And we'd have a little, you know, funny repartee. He'd sometimes stare at me like Bill Belichick with a question. And we had a good bit going. And then you'd come in after the game and you'd do that as well, even at, you know, after a win or a loss. So it, there was a great fan interactive experience. And I think, I think a lot of, I really do believe Saginaw was innovative in that. So they weren't winning on the ice. But they were do a little, doing a lot of things off the ice that I think were really, really influential in a lot of other OHL rinks. That you, you got the access that you're just not going to get, um, you know, in in the National Hockey League. And and as you guys know, hockey, hockey as an industry, and I think especially the NHL has this, you know, where's the personality amongst the players? Like like stop stamping it out and 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 you know drowning it um, because you don't want anybody to say anything that might be the least bit you know opinionated. And, and I think we were able to do stuff in there that was, that was different. So um, they had drafted, I'll, I'll bring up a couple of players that you guys would remember and the audience might remember. They had a really good draft in, after their first year, uh, they drafted Patrick McNeil, a defenseman first overall. I will tell you, they wanted Bobby Ryan to come. The, they, that was the Bobby Ryan draft year. Owen Sound drafted him second. And um, Bobby Ryan wanted things, uh, I'll just put it bluntly, that the, the spirit thought we could get in trouble for this. OK, that's not necessarily money, but but he wanted uh, perks, if you will, with the franchise uh, and the Ryan family wanted perks and the spirit didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, and so they drafted Patrick McNeil as a defenseman. Uh, Tom Pyatt, obviously, was, who played in the NHL, his brother Taylor did, his dad Nelson did. So you got great bloodline there. Um, and they drafted a few other players that were impactful. In fact, they drafted Phil Kessel um, in about the fourth round at fifth round of the OHL draft that year. And they were really, really hopeful that they could Bob's big job, according to, to him was the owner said, you know, get Phil Kessel, get him not to go to, to college um, and, and play. Uh, he was a Minnesota board or sorry, a Wisconsin board kid who went and played for the golden Gophers only played the one year and then was in the, in the NHL at 19 but they really wanted him. But Bob really, you know, Bob was so connected in the NHL. And I think that was something they had sort of lacked uh, early days on. And Bob had a lot of respect. Bob, Bob brought imports in. I don't need to tell you guys how important it is to get the right imports. They've got to be impactful players. Your overagers have to be impactful players. If you're going anywhere, 
Um, if your overagers aren't playing on the power play or they're not playing a top four defense role or they're not your starting goalie, there's no point in having overagers. Those guys have to be impactful players uh, to help lead the younger players along the way. But, you know, it was still really a struggle. London and Kitchener were the powerhouses. Uh, London, Kitchener, and Plymouth, those first several years, it was hard to get points off them. Almost impossible. Your, your best chance to get points off those teams was at the start of the year when there'd be 11 London Knights at NHL training camps <laughs> or nine Kitchener Rangers at NHL training camps. You want to play those teams in late September when those kids were at camp. And Saginaw wasn't missing too many players at NHL training camps, put it that way. You mentioned the personality of these players and how we didn't get to see it as much back then. With all due respect to Vinny Trochuk, maybe perhaps the most famous Saginaw spirit of all time, Paul Bissonette. What was it like being around a guy like that who obviously has a lot of personality that we're seeing right now? Maybe not so much. Back yeah, then. you can't really predict what, like nobody could see Paul having sort of the the media career he's had. Or, or it, that's the thing, Chris, even the NHL career he's had because – he was a guy, he was our best defenseman in Saginaw. The first two years I was there um, in 02, 03, and 03, 04, but they didn't want him to fight. They did not, they, they needed him. We were not good. And Paul needed to play 26 minutes a night. And so getting into trouble and standing up for, for teammates was something he had to do occasionally, but they didn't want him taking a five minute fighting major unless it was absolutely necessary so the idea that he goes to the nhl becomes a winger almost never plays defense and i think that started in the penguin system in the ahl at wilkesbury um that was that was rather remarkable but he had he had an engaging personality um i i love the fact that uh the players would watch so the players would get a video cut with my play-by-play -play on it and i love the fact he was the first player to email me halfway through the second year and say um, you kind of blame me on this goal here. I want you to know what I saw. And I had tremendous respect for that because you guys know live microphone. Um, you know, I always said this with, with Mike doing the talk show, 17 and a half hours of, of, you know, morning talk radio a week. You're not going to get everything right. You're going to, you're going to say something that doesn't sound right. It's going to be clunky and play by play. Certainly. So when you're doing a four or five minute stretch and you gotta, you know, you, you're trying to see things develop but you got to call what you're seeing at that particular given time. So I love that he did that. Um, he was, he was traded to Owen sound. Um, I think he was, he was, uh, he was moved to Owen sound when the, when the, the attack were really going for it, but yeah, he was um, I think he drove coaches kind of crazy because he was so outspoken, but I think it was, an, again, it was an important thing for, for him to start developing um, in terms of, uh, in terms of a personality and, and he's uh, boy, he's, he's just, you know, uh, I give him full credit for taking it to where he, he, he could have um, his parents were great. He was a great kid to, uh, to watch play and, and watch develop. Always really polite with me. I got Chris Thorburn was there my rookie year. What a phenomenal guy he was. Uh, he'd call me Mr. Brady. I got, I'm 29 years old. He's calling me Mr. Brady. That was <laughs> really not appropriate. Um, but uh, you know, uh, either way, uh, yeah, Paul was, Paul was certainly somebody, Chris, that was, uh, he, he didn't quite have a conventional NHL career. Like I thought he would. And I thought he'd play. I, I really, you know, the three of us could come up with, with tens and twenties of players that we thought would be, you know, more successful in their, uh, in their NHL career. I, I'll give you, I'll give you a Kitchener Ranger, Steve Eminger, man amongst boys in the OHL. I thought that guy would be a phenomenal uh, NHL defenseman. And um, it's hard, man. It's, it's the hardest league on the planet by far. There's not even a close second for a reason. So uh, yeah, Paul, Paul ended up doing really well for himself and uh, still is entertaining people. You mentioned coaches, Greg, and the spirit obviously gets started with Rosie, Dennis DeRose, the former player, and becomes the first coach for the franchise. But there was a there was a little bit of a of a carousel going on. And Doug Lidster was there for a bit. What what happened with the coaching sort of carousel in those early years? Yeah, I'll tell you something quick about Rosie. First year, uh, again, this goes to my tardiness, but I'm driving up to meet the bus to go up to Sault Ste. Marie. So I'm driving 80 miles north. Then we're going another four hours north. And it's a straight shot, like Wednesday road game. So th this would be what my day would be, Mike. I'll lay this out. Wednesday, I'm doing morning show at WDFN in Detroit. So I'm up at, you know, 4.30, on the air at 6, off the air at 9. Um, could maybe maybe go to the gym for an hour. I'm leaving to meet the bus around 1 o'clock. 
and I run into some traffic. I'm about, I get there about 108. Dennis is waiting by the bus. I get out of my car. I grab my bag. He's just, he, he stares right through my soul. Like this is a guy that sawed grown men who could break phone books and have down in the International Hockey League in the 70s and 80s. And he just looks at me and he goes, that was your freebie. There won't be another one. Wow. So, um, you know, I needed that. Maybe I needed that when we worked together. I needed a Don Collins to be, you know, I don't think like, his, it, up. Yeah, his stare Steven wouldn't is, have been the was, same. He's, he's just listening to 680 news. He's not listening to us. He's not. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you do a great segment. You don't hear from him for nine days. You do week after week of great segments. You don't hear from him. One bad segment for you, me and Lang. And we're, uh, we're called onto the carpet. That's how it works. <laughs> so, uh, Doug was hired. Yeah. Doug, Doug came from, uh, uh, Doug came from Colorado. Uh, he was coaching, I think, in, uh, in doing some college assistant work. Gets hired by Bob Mancini. Those guys had known each other um, through NHL Connections. And I really liked Doug. And, and Doug liked the fact that I was a, uh, a Vancouver Canucks fan as a little kid, which you uh, remember well. You know how sad I was after 2011. I do remember that. I yes. said they're never going to win again. <laughs> and they haven't won a playoff series since. I don't count last year's... Uh, Travis Sham mockery of a, of a playoff round win. I guess I could, I guess they're uh, slightly back on track, but uh, Doug, by the way, had, Oh, I, you know, I could probably get away with telling this Doug had a Vladimir Krutov story. So Vladimir Krutov, this unbelievable talent, like maybe the best player in the 87 Canada cup, not named Mario Lemieux or Wayne Gretzky gets signed by the Canucks. The Canucks, the Canucks draft Igor Larionov and Vladimir Krutov. And everybody knows Igor Larionov played in the league a long, 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 long time. Hockey Hall of Famer. Professor. He adjusted to North America. Uh, the late Vladimir Krutov did not. Showed up at camp, uh, you know, quite overweight, out of shape. This is fall of 89. So this is only two years removed from the Canada Cup. Lidster says there's two great stories about, about the tank, which they called him. And again, you know, is that bullying now? Can you call it, like, if you went to high school, could you go, here comes the tank? I don't know that you can even do that anymore. Um, so anyway, uh, you end up, you end up with two stories about, about Krutov. One, is that he attached a string to the light, the light switch. Like this is before the clapper. He attached a string that he could reach from his bed to turn the light on and off because he just stayed in bed eating all day at his apartment. So this is like a, just a, a, a lever back and forth. He's clever. He might've had an engineering degree. The second story is the first long road trip the Canucks take being a West Coast team he, you know, pe people are getting on, they're dressed for four games, nine days on the road, something like that. Krutov gets on wearing a suit, but just carrying like a shaving kit. And they look at him, he gets on the bus to go to the airport, to go to wherever. And Krutov just has like, like just a big shaving kit. And he you know, sits it down on the bus. And they're like, like, you know, Tank, wh where, are your, where are your suits? Like, where's your bag? And he's like, I don't, you know, I'm just going to wear this suit is basically how he explains it. He might've had an interpreter explain it. Then he opens up the shaving kit and in the shaving kit are just two cold cans of beer. <laughs> I, he just pops the pops that open and, and starts with a traveler on the way to the airport for the, so they're like, not, he didn't bring any toilet. We thought they were toiletries. It's just, it's just two cans of Molson dry. What are we doing? My kind of guy. Yeah. So he, I think he only played the one year before he went to Switzerland. Okay, a little less funny. Doug is coaching the Spirit. And uh, where this starts is we've got a Thursday night game home against the Erie Otters. Uh, team made a bad trade involving a, uh, a guy named uh, Jeff Platt, who I really, really liked. He was gone on. And if you, if you uh, hockey DB Jeff Platt, the guy's just still tearing it up in the KHL. But he, we traded him to Erie, not for very much in return. And... Um, and Platt is there that night and he scored a couple goals and the fans are getting restless. Like uh, it might've been even his first game back um, after. So this is, the, this is our third year in Saginaw. Uh, so it gets to be about four one. And in the third period, they pull like Doug pulls the goalie. And I thought that was a bit strange. Like you pull the goalie, right. You know, two goals on the first five shots, you're trying to make a difference. You got a guy starting fresh in the second period. Our goalie's name is Mike Brown, who was a Boston Bruins draft pick. Um, and, and again, a nice kid, but a bad moment here. What he does on the way to the bench is he makes a motion with the stick. Um, basically, and I, you know, I think we're safe within, uh, within uh, we're in the safe space here. 
He makes a motion with his stick like he's jerking off towards Doug Lidster, towards the head coach. No doubt about it. I watched this from my perch and I know, I know that's what he did. So he goes to the bench, sits down and you can still see, it's not quite, you know, Patrick Waugh, hey, I've played my last game here, but there's some kind of interaction between him and uh, him and, and Doug. Sunday, uh, the story is, and, and I believe this has been verified by so many people, there's a confrontation in the dressing room after one of the practices and Doug pokes Mike Brown in the chest with, with, with a finger. Okay. doesn't like this, that that's it. That's the extent of the physical contact between the two, but there's yelling. That's for sure. But I think you guys would know uh, we've heard of stories where it's gotten a lot more confrontational. We've been through this sort of evolution in the last year and a half when we've talked about stuff with Mike Babcock and Bill Peters and other coaches and, and gone, okay, there's some line crossing here. Um, Mike, Brown told his parents uh, that there, it, it, and eventually the parents want, you know, the owner to do something and the GM to do something. And Doug was relieved of his duties. I didn't think that was great. I didn't think that was right. Um, I don't, you know, should Doug poke a 17 year old kid in the chest? Maybe not. But as we would know, um, you know, to me, if, if Mike Brown is my son and my son calls me, and, I, and he says, the, the coach poked me in the chest. I'm confident enough that I've raised my kid a certain way that I'd be like, what did you do? What was your accountability? What was your uh, you know, part in the interaction? So I, I think it's sort of, Bob took over behind the bench and with Ian Herbers as an assistant coach, Bob, Bob and Ian were, were excellent coaches. But I think it took Doug some time, um, even in 2000 four and beyond he was he helped coach the canadian women's team he then was on the bench with willie desjardin both with the uh um the stars farm team in iowa and then they get the vancouver job willie willie gets him as his first assistant with the vancouver canucks job but i didn't think it was i didn't think it was awesome and uh and the great thing again the great thing about the, the spirit ownership and dick garber is i, I said i want to know how i can approach this on the air and talk about why doug isn't there um, and you know, it's not, I don't write the checks, uh, you know, Dick Garber writes them, but I also have a responsibility as I've always felt, Mike, you know, me as a broadcaster, as well as anybody does that I'm going to go on and I'm going to be honest about my feelings and I'm not going to couch anything. And, um, if there's shrapnel that I have to deal with later because of something, uh, you know, me overstepping, I'm more than able to be accountable for that, but I want to know what I what, what you think I should say here, and then I'm going to sort of determine what needs to be said because I thought it was a really, I thought it was a really bad look to fire a guy for poking a kid in the chest. Um, uh, and again, I won't I won't justify touching another, but this isn't an 11 year old. This isn't a bullying situation. If anything, I think the coach had to stand up and say, "This is this is I'm I'm still the adult here," and 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 what you did to me because I don't think Doug saw the gesture to get back to that. But I think word got back around to him. And you can imagine, you'd almost be more okay seeing it, processing it, counting to 10, as opposed to people coming to you and saying, uh, guess what this guy did to you. It's a little bit like, I'd rather someone said something to me, to my face about who I am and what's happening. And even, a, you know, a discussion with my wife or something, then find out that a bunch of stuff's being said about somebody behind their back. And I think that's how Doug took it, which may have led to the, the confrontation. I think anybody who's listened to any of your radio shows for an hour knows you're not going to couch anything, Braids. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. It, it was a t it was a tough one though because I think when uh, when there's personnel issues and and even when there were player discipline issues, um, it's uh, you guys would know it's a it's a slippery slope. You are I, I was an employee of the team, but I also think doing a radio show um, and not you know objectively able to speak about all the teams without somebody going, Hey, you're being too hard on the tigers or the pistons or the lions or whatever. Well, I was, while I was there and the same thing in Toronto and Mike, you know, that, that, you know, that's been a, tr that's a trickier ball game with the blue Jays. It just is because you're seen as partners. I, I understand that. And I think, uh, you know, I, I got it and, and actually embraced that. And I think when we worked for Don, there was definitely a sense that, you know, be fair, but don't make it personal. And that's all you should ever do at the end of the day. When you're calling a bad hockey team's games and, you know, they're getting, you know, they're losing seven, one every night, you know, it's, it's tough to accentuate the positive. Nobody wants to sound 
nobody wants to sound like a phony. Nobody does. Like, you, you know, and, and I, I, I remember Costa and I having a discussion. It's interesting to bring that up, Chris, because Costa and I had a discussion and he's like, I think you're being a little hard on our players. And then it turned around and we might have won three games out of four in the first year, or early in the second year. And Cost is like, you know, you know, now I see it. Now I see you're, you're saying great things. I'm like, all you need to do is give me a good team and, and I'll, sing the, I'll sing their praises. But you guys know how difficult it is to do when there's just nothing, there's no compliments to give. And, and the, audience, the audience still wants, yeah, they're Saginaw fans, Kitchener fans, Windsor fans but they still deserve authenticity. They really do. Like, and I think sports talk radio is, is also, you know, I, I think you need that at the end of the day. Uh, and I, you know, I, I strove for that. Uh, Mike strove for that when I would do shows with him and we talk about Toronto sports or, uh, or his beloved Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, you know, that like there'd be a way to do it be, where you earn the audience's respect um, and, and you don't just, you know, you're not just a fan on, on the radio. There's plenty of blogs for that. There's plenty of podcasts where it's just, Hey, we're, we're big Toronto Maple Leafs fans. And we're just, we're accentuating the, that's great. And there's a, there's a space for those in our universe, but if you're paying me to be objective, that's what I have to be. And so it was tricky. It was really, those things are really, really tricky to navigate when you, you don't have a very good team's games to call for quite a while. Just know, Greg, that with every playoff letdown of the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think about how much you're enjoying it. Because I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> I, but think about this. Like, you, you can't call yourself long-suffering. I, I don't feel – then again, everyone's made a big deal about Aaron Rodgers only going to one Super Bowl. Big Ben's probably had enough talent around him to go to more than two. I will say that. Probably we'll look at him and go, that's a guy that probably should have gone to four or five Super Bowls. But outside of Tom Brady, who's going to four or five Super Bowls? Nobody. Nobody is. There's no, you know, we're not seeing Troy Aikman win three or four years. Uh, any Patrick Mahomes, right? That's that's the guy. Yeah, it is the guy. Um, you were in Saginaw when uh, the whole Colbert rapport thing came to life, and Colbert took a liking to the team, and then there was a mascot naming or something. What what happened there for people who aren't aware? The uh, I can't remember the genesis of there was something to do with the mayor of Oshawa and Stephen Colbert and either they made fun of Oshawa about something in a segment during the show Chris and the Oshawa mayor didn't like it uh and you know maybe half-heartedly didn't like it um this is and this is certainly pre-Twitter because this would be around 0506 so Colbert did a segment just and and when it's not even the current mayor of Oshawa it's a former mayor of Oshawa. And when they were like, um, you know, put a, put a Chiron up, they just had a picture of a moose. So they basically, <laughs> this is a man also, I should make that very clear again. We're not, like enough of the body shaming. Come on kids. It, doesn't, it wasn't okay then. And it's not okay now. The but, moose's uh, name was tank, by the way. It, that's right. Yeah. Tank. Here comes yeah. tank, uh, male or female. Doesn't matter. But either way, you had a scenario where the, the mayor was being like castigated by Colbert and then Colbert knew like somehow a Saginaw Oshawa game got on his radar and, and it was like they made a bet about the game and then the, the Colbert demanded of the spirit that they, he was like, I'm now the biggest Saginaw spirit fan because they're playing Oshawa on this date. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm supporting the spirit so much that they should name a mascot after me. So I, now I thought, I remember hearing about this again, this is, this is pre social media. I remember hearing about this, even in Detroit, it might've been one of my honor partners on the morning show said, did you, did you see Steve Colbert talked about the Saginaw spirit last night? And I'm like, news to me. Um, but he did. And the spirit uh, and Craig Goslin, one of the, the co-owners uh, and uh, and the president of the team, uh, decided like, oh, we're in. Like we're <laughs> this yes, isn't even a conversation. Yeah. Like get the you know get them get the costume ready, get the feathers going, get the <laughs> you know get hockey pants that fit a mascot. Uh, and they they ended up the next game out. They introduced they had I can't even remember what the original costume what the original mascot's name was for the spirit. But the next, the next mascot they introduced, and his name was Steagle Cole Beagle the Eagle. I, you know, so you're doing the the starters and scratches. 
the spotlight's going around. It's dark at uh, at the Dow Event Center, and you, I, I didn't even know about it actually. I, you'd think I would have been given some heads up, but that this tiny like he looks like the guys the guys it looks like the regular mascot's son coming onto the ice in in an eagle costume in like blue, yellow, red, and and white. And so Colbert loved that. And this eventually this whole arc came up. Like you'd think, you know, remember this is the Iraq wars going on, eight years of George W. Bush. You'd think Colbert had enough material as, <laughs> as you know, as, as the, uh, as doing a parody of a right-wing pundit, but he would show spirit highlights. Like, like with me calling the games, he had Bob Mancini our general manager and coach on the show, on the phone. Um, I, like just talking about the, ins how inspiring, Steagle, Cole Beagle, the Eagle was as a mascot. It was a very, and then it just stopped. <laughs> like any good radio show, you know yeah. when to stop your, you know when your bit is exhausting. Well, maybe Mike, we didn't know that. <laughs> but your goal is to know when your bit uh, exhausts, exhausts the audience. And at some point, Colbert just sort of dropped the spirit like a, like a bad habit. Maybe he didn't like a couple of the trade deadline moves uh, late, late one season. I don't know. Hey, you got to be on the Colbert Report. That's all that matters. I did. I yeah, yeah. I'm like, what's the John Day, John Stewart, the Daily Show, right? Next Daily week? Show, yeah. Moving on, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to take a bit of a half step sideways here because when you were telling the Krutoff story earlier about getting on the bus with <laughs> nothing but a shaving kit, I, I think I speak for all of us on. I know Chris and I, certainly when the longer road trips come for us, and we don't have that many with Kitchener, let's be honest. But when you're doing a northern swing. I try to pack as light as I can. Can I make two suits go for four nights or something like that? You were doing this job, Greg, along with morning sports in Detroit. Uh, and, and you talked about 80 miles away from the rink. How, like, take us inside a little bit of your life when you're trying to pull this off. Yeah, I did six years of that with the same show, um, six to 9 a.m. doing sports uh, and, and, and the spirit road trip. So, we all get excited. You guys do too. When, when, you know, the schedule comes out and you're like, okay, you know, it's great. Like, it's great to go to Ottawa in October, not January. Like you're, you're really hoping Ottawa's the nice, like, I don't know what second place Ottawa's the nicest city to walk around by far <laughs> it, that you'll have time to, because you guys would never stay over in London and we never did either. So our not that we'd want to braids just for the record, not that we <laughs> you, would want to you a place should. dive. It's, it's, oh my God. Head down to the seeps. And <laughs> oh, Joe it's a Kool's dive. And you should want these things. Um, but yeah, it was like, I mentioned that Wednesday, Wednesday trip, Mike, like it was, I was just thinking about this week um, because my kid turned, my oldest son turned 15 uh, Sunday, January 31st. So that was Super Bowl week in Detroit. And my wife and I, that's Pittsburgh, Seattle, Mike. That's a Super Bowl near and dear to your heart, right? It is. I mean, it is. How, who, who else can shut down Matt Hasselbeck in a big game? I mean, you're lucky it wasn't Russell Wilson. <laughs> Get him anytime five years later and you don't win that game. <laughs> but, but, and Jerome Bettis, right? The bus comes that's back to right. Detroit and wins the Super Bowl. Absolutely. But my recollection is, that week, you know, alone where it's Super Bowl week. So my kid ends up being born a Monday night going into Tuesday. So he's born about Tuesday at 2 a.m. We had Super Bowl like theme shows from the Renaissance Center right by the border um, every day that week. And so I missed the Tuesday show coming in because, you know, my kid had been born five hours earlier. But I went back and I did Wednesday show and I did Thursday show. And then that night we were Saginaw was in Windsor. So I did that game that night, um, you know, until 10 o'clock or so come back across the border. And then I'm ready for another Friday. Then I'm ready to wrap the week Friday show. Again, my kid's three days old at this point. We have a Friday Saginaw home game. I go back home. We have a Saturday Saginaw home game, 80 miles up, 80 miles back. Once again, Sunday is the very first time I'm working for BBC on the Super Bowl. So I'm on the broadcast. So I'm gone from eight in the morning until, you know, midnight Sunday with, with my wife uh, at home with her kid four four days old, our son, uh, her parents had left on the Friday. Um, but you know, like she, she's watching that Super Bowl, the Super Bowl XL with just, just the baby. And then the next week we leave on Wednesday night for a trip to that we do that Ottawa Kingston Belleville loop. So I think about the madness of that. And 
you know, how exhausted I was. Um, and, and it was tiring before. And you really felt like in a coho scenario. Um, and Mike, you were like, again, like I, I, the, the fun that you and me and Jim had, and the fact that we were all up on what we needed to be up on and still maintaining sleep and still maintaining a normal life. Like that was as some of the most fun radio I've ever had in my life. I know I've said that to you before, but it's worth saying publicly. I've only said it uh, privately. Um, but it, it was, it, you owe your partners, um, you know, keeping up. Like you can't, you can't just come in and not have seen anything and not know what the hell is going on. So you guys can imagine pre where everything's on your phone. Um, and, and I don't think like, I, I when, when was the first time any of us texted like 2004, 2005, or you could get scores on your phone, maybe around 2003 or four. So the first couple of years of that were, coming home on a Sunday night, guys, from a, from a road trip, like that Ottawa Kingston Belleville road trip, knowing you're going to work in about four or five hours and you haven't seen the Lions game or the Michigan football game or the Michigan state football game and two Red Wings games and two Pistons games. There were eight teams to keep on top of in Detroit. Now they're not all playing at the same time, but it's the four pro teams and Michigan, Michigan state football, basketball here in Toronto. It, it's, it's, you know, you leaves first by a wide margin, Jays and Raptors fight for a lot of that depends on who's hot as we know, but you really don't, you don't, you don't have to keep track of eight teams. You do not have to keep track of all that stuff. So, so the de- living in Detroit and doing all that, but also being really dialed into the league, um, Mike, that's, that was, I, you know, I won't say that there's people that have harder jobs than all of us and a lot more to, to juggle from a manual labor perspective, but it did, you know, it, it did create, uh, uh, you know, very, very uh, long nights, a lot of periods of time without sleep. Um, you would, you would not, uh, you, you would not eat great on the road. <laughs> so, uh, or you would eat a lot on the road that wasn't great. Uh, so, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of times when, um, you know, I was, I was really, it's like the U2 song. I was running to stand still. I was working really hard just to maintain um, sanity and, and making sure um, that I brought it. I had, I had to bring it for the broadcast and I had to bring it for the show uh, in Detroit. But you know what? Like now when I'm not as busy and I'm not as scrambled and I've got the parenting thing down, I've got everything else down, um, it, you know, I still put in, you know, I, I still put the time in because I'm like, boy, if I could do it then, then I shouldn't have a problem, you know, getting down and, and prepping for a show now and making sure – um, in the news talk realm, um, you know, I'm on top of everything I need to be as you are, Mike, like it's, you know, it's, it's not the, it's not a seamless transition. So you gotta, you, you gotta do the work and, and put the time in, but they were harrowing, um, you know, they were harrowing years and, uh, but I loved it. I wouldn't have traded it for anything. And, you know, the, the traveling with the team, how, how the team felt after they, you know, would win a big game. And, and I didn't see a lot of winning while I was in Saginaw or, or the year in Windsor really, but it's, um, it, it was so, so rewarding to feel uh, you were part of building something and you're watching, you know, younger men grow into, you know, mature, younger boys grow into mature men over a three or four year process. And uh, I loved every second of it. I, I miss it terribly. I'm, I, you know, I wanted to keep going and doing Windsor games while I lived in Toronto, but, uh, that's later in the, later in the, in the story, later in the arc, I realized how impossible that was going to be. I was going to ask how much easier was your life doing all that when you made the switch from Saginaw to doing Spitz games? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, uh, I knew I did that in the summer of 07. Um, I knew I, I knew that the Spitz had had an opening, um, and uh, and I saw, I saw what Bob Bugner and Warren Reichel were kind of building there. I'd seen it; they'd only owned the team, Chris. I think the one year before, maybe two at max. But but when they bought the t- look, the the Steve Riolo Spitfires, um, I wouldn't have worked for. It. I wouldn't have worked for. It. it just seemed, it seemed to have too much dysfunction. I, it's funny. I was talking about the car trips with Bob Mancini earlier on we found out at the same time about the whole uh, bus incident with Steve Downey, with Akeem Alou. Like we found out about that at the exact same. And he just looked at me and he's like, Riola is going to have to sell the team. And I don't think Riola was forced to sell the team, but it led to that massive suspension for Momantha. Um, you know, the, the, the spits are, 
They were North American news. Like you don't, if you're in, put it this way, guys, if you're an OHL team and you end up on ESPN Sports Center, and they did that night, I remember us driving back from a game, turning on Sports Center, and they're talking about, they got footage, that footage of the Downey Alou fight on ice and Mantha explaining it. I'm like, this is bad. This is really bad for the Windsor Spitfires to be on ESPN. So, um, but when Booner and Reichel bought the team, uh, it seemed to be moving in a different direction. And we had, it's interesting. I mentioned my kid being born. Um, we were pregnant with our second child in summer of 07. And something just felt different. Like Detroit was, I'd done the same morning show for five and a half years. I loved it. Um, but we, we had started to miss Canada a little bit. I'd been there in the States since late 98. Uh, I still was only two and a half hours away from my folks. But I, I missed... I did miss living in Canada. I, I will say I didn't at first because the States was really new and fun. It was great to crack it and, and have fun. And like I said, go to all these, you know, events that you, 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 you never dream about doing. And, uh, you know, you, you end up, uh, we had a lot of conversations about having the potential to move back. And I'll tell you that summer, two things happened that were interesting. One is that I reached out to the Spitfires and said, I might be willing to, to leave the spirit and come to work for you. And Bob Bugner was very like, you know, very interested. And we had a, we, we went and met and had a great conversation in the middle of August. Um, and, uh, and then we, we got that deal done. And, uh, but I had to drive, I, I drove to Saginaw to tell the Saginaw guys who'd been awesome to me, like, honestly, just incredibly awesome that I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to come back for that year. And I did that like as quickly as I could in the middle of July. Um, again, we've, so we've got a one and a half old and, and we were probably found out we were pregnant with a kid that was going to be born the next May. So maybe we weren't, we were right around there. Um, but, but I drove to Saginaw told now they had let Bob Mancini go. And um, Mike, you remember this, especially they hired a GM named Sheldon Ferguson. Do you remember this? I do. And then all of a sudden, a week later, he he didn't take the job. Like they, it, it was something to do with they wanted him to move there, and he didn't understand that. But it was, it, it, and then they hired Don Edwards. Yep. And that was strange because I just didn't get a great vibe that Edwards was going to do a really bang up job there. And I love Bob. I will say, like we've all been there. You guys have too, where you're like, I, I'm sure you know Kitchener went through that going. Um, you know, when, when, when a Pete DeBoer leaves your franchise or a Steve spot leaves your franchise, it shakes your foundation a little bit. It has to. And, um, and I felt that way when Bob left, I, I didn't think, um, you know, we had, they had, you know, gunned up and had a really deep team in 06, 07. And we lost to the Sioux in six games in the first round, but they had gone and traded for Ryan O'Mara. They got a, a young score named Ryan McDonough the year before. And that was sort of the end for that sort of group I mentioned, McNeil, Pyatt, um, Patrick Aslan. And it just felt like the end of something. And, um, and Windsor felt like um, it had some promise. But to your point, Chris, yeah, it was a lot closer for me to, you know, it was half an hour plus a, a border stop. And I, I had a proper visa so I could get, you know, across the border and, and do the games at the old barn. We were talking about how there just aren't any of those buildings left. And, and that was, uh, you know, that was one of the, the last remnant. So to do, to do games in Windsor arena, where I'd always enjoyed going as a visitor to work for, to work closer geographically, to work for a Canadian team again. Um, I, I was all in and that was, you know, and again, that's the one thing that happened. The second thing was I'd reached out to Gord Harris, who was the program director at, he taught me in university or in uh, college at Fanshawe after I went to Western and uh, broadcast journalism. And I'd worked for him briefly at PL. And, uh, and he was running 640 then. And Jeff Merrick had left 640 and Leafs Lunch to go work on Sirius on Hockey Night in Canada Radio. So they had an opening and they were moving the Bill Waters show to drive time to go up against Bob McCown. So I remember emailing him about the job in September. And then he got, he, he got back and he's like, okay, you know, here's some of the specifics of it. And I think I wrote him back and I said, God, I'm really interested in talking more about it, but I don't, you know, if I, if I can't, you know, I, I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel it was the right time. And I'm like, damn it, I'm going to miss this opportunity. And that leads to 
uh, our show got kind of blown up in November and all of us lost our job on the same day. We'd had the same morning show for five and a half years, but the economy had just hammered um, Detroit and Michigan before it hammered everywhere else. I mean, global recession with, uh, with, you know, with the big companies in 08, but in Detroit, we were feeling it in 07 with the auto industry. So the day, the day I got fired was November 5th, 2007. And I, I call Gord Harris that day and I'm like, you know, do you have any newscasting jobs? I, 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 I want to newscast again um, or just get my foot in the door. And that was the only, the first place I could think of to go. And he's like, well, we haven't hired the water show host yet. Like we don't, we can't find the right person. We, they've tried a bunch of people for two and a half months and, uh, and nothing fit. And that eventually worked out very, very quickly. Um, and uh, but I'd already started working for the Spitz two or three, two or three months before, and uh, just was having the time of my life. I wish it could have kept going, but you know, you guys know, and anybody who, is, especially in the last you know year, knows it. it the uh, if one door closes, another door opens, and those were the doors I had to walk through. Lots to talk about with the Spitz. Uh, not only Reichel and Bugner, but some kid named Hall. But I want to <laughs> jump off something you. You mentioned when you talked about the barn and you and I will still, I'll do this to you on purpose because having worked with you and I remember the conversations we have when I'm on the road, particularly in Oshawa and or Sudbury, I like to let you know on Twitter that the, the pure death defying feats I'm in the midst of getting to press boxes and whatnot. <laughs> uh, what, what were your memories of some of the barns? When I'm in Saginaw, Popa, remember, we had to go up. We stood on chairs the one night because they pushed us yeah. so far into a corner the one time and they had this curtain up. I literally couldn't see the one end of the ice until I stood up on a folding chair. It was crazy. But th these are some of the Wait a sec. I, Let's start there. Who do I need get to back talk to? to? We got to get back to Joey, yeah. I think, on this. I, I had one, I had who one who of those. I need to talk to about that. You guys, that should be one of the best road radio uh spots in the league you're high no. up you see everything Best i don't get food. it where do they move you well, to i'm small i'm diminutive in stature i have to stand on tiptoes at the best of times but it was just they they shoved us a little further down to the corner and they i guess it was uh it was Malat's fault, wasn't it? Larry, yeah. and during a Guelph, the Guelph-Saginaw playoff series, I guess they kind of got on each other's nerves because the broadcast crews were a little too close. Or no, the off-ice the off -ice officials were, you know, they're tracking shots, they're tracking penalties and stuff. And I guess Larry thought they were being kind of homers. So they had to divide the broadcast crew from the, oh yeah, it's all on Malat. So, so this curtain. The, yeah, they moved you yeah. all the way down to the right. And then right next to you are the on-ice crews and they're, Stand, sitting right next to you, shoulder to shoulder, and they're like seven, five, 13, 21, <laughs> 27, oh, five, 17, 20. That wasn't a penalty. That's crazy. And then, then they started on with, yeah, what they thought of the game. And Milan, I guess, told them that, that you don't do that in the press box. And then they had to put up one of those accordion wardrobe, uh, I don't know, screens. Yeah. Well, there's Bottom two line things. Is, there's you two things. See, uh, you know, I, I'm talking too much about, about, you know, m like my autobiography, and I need to tell more stories about some of the BS stuff that I witnessed in the OHL. So we can do that. Saginaw, I've never seen more off ice officials in my life <laughs> with in any building. I don't know what all those people do. I have no idea why they need so many people. I'm glad it's a night out. I, I hope that none of their, you know, I hope none of their, uh, you know, stipends affected my stipend for calling games for those six <laughs> years. I don't feel like it did. Uh, Farwell, honestly, I, I, I drive a tough bargain. I was one of the, I, I know I was, I was getting a per game salary better than well, I could go alphabetically, um, better than anybody else, any other play by play guy working in Michigan. I'll say that. I think that's fairly obvious, but anyway, uh, I, I, I remember being up that high and, uh, you, you've got to stand. There's nowhere to sit. You do have to stand to call games in Saginaw. But I also remember one time um, I had the crowd mic wrapped around like an XLR crowd mic um, dangling down, wrapped around one of the poles. And I remember one day doing a game with Sean Belegian. Sean had done mostly Whalers games, but one year he did the Spirit games with me. And uh, that's great because we, we, you know, our shows led into each other at DFN. We, we got to be, we had so much fun doing hockey shows in Michigan and yelling at each other but the, the mic unwound and there was a guy with his kid down below and it must, that mic like cracked maybe a, a, a half seat away from the kid. And I can only imagine the lawsuit. Like he just looked up and I'm like, 
sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Which wouldn't have been acceptable had the microphone walloped that eight-year-old in the skull because it came down and it was it was a missile. So I don't like being that high up. And and you're right, you've tempted me. You've, you've provoked me more than anything with, yeah, um, that's about it. which is a form of temptation. Um, <laughs> I remember from uh, early university days and th- in Oshawa, that was a, like, that was a harrowing walk to the press box. It still is. It always will be. Did they forget to build a proper route there? And it was a last minute, like the Joe Louis arena press box, which that's they exactly. forgot to build. Yeah, that's exactly. exactly. That would happen because yes. it is, you look down and it looks like ants on a bar of soap. <laughs> <laughs> when the players are warming up and when you're carrying metal suitcases and you and you're wearing a suit and not sensible shoes it's it's scarring mentally to walk across those catwalks i, I hated going to oshawa just for that reason alone i still think hamilton's worse though and i haven't I, done a game there what's what happened at, at cops what happened oh there? well i think you're so much higher and one you're in cops so you are a little sketched <laughs> out by the building <laughs> And then you're walking across, like you have to go right basically to center ice before you turn left to go over to the side. And at this point, you're looking down at the ice and you're like, there's nothing that's going to stop me if one of these rivets decides to go because how long ago was this building built and hasn't been maintained? And then it's shaking when you're up there. I can't do it. It is way too high. Do you med- medicate beforehand? Like, and pizza and donuts in the press, in the, in the press lounge doesn't count. Or even, even when they give you that soup that they used to give you in Sault Ste. Marie. They still do the soup. They yeah. still do the soup. Yep. I just make sure I walk behind Farzi that if I do fall, I can at least grab him. <laughs> so that we, yeah, go, down, know, we yeah, go down together. You, you don't want, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not like combat where you don't want to be the first guy, like, but you also don't right. want to trip and, and, you know, elbow into somebody. Yeah. And then you're both going over the edge. Um, and, and that's the be- that's not a good place to fight with off ice officials about the shot. I remember, I, I think I did snap. I, I will say Gary Doyle's a lovely guy. I think I snapped at him about the, the shot. I think, I think I snapped about the shots in Kitchener one night. I do. But I will say this. When, when that Mike Brown kid came back, the kid that, that got Doug Lidster fired, he was playing with Owen Sound. They traded him and Bissonette in the same deal. And uh, Bob said that Bob Mancini said to the shot clock guy, he's like, just, just fiddle with the shots all night, like on, <laughs> on Saginaw's side. And I, was, I know this is going to happen. So it's easy for me to look up at the shots. Like, honestly, like like one stoppage of play, you'd look up and it'd be Saginaw, 18 shots, Owen Sound, seven. Next thing you'd look up and you'd go, it'd say like Saginaw, nine shots, Owen Sound, 11. And I'm like, I might be the only one noticing this because who's watching, you know, if you're play-by-play, it's one of your first go-tos is, you know, score, time, shots on goal, penalty time left. But, I, but the great thing is, Wander, watching when the play was down to the other end, watching Mike Brown just sort of skate around, shaking his head, glancing up at the shot board, shaking his head some more. I'm, I, know they're fi- I know they're messing with him, but he doesn't. So I love that. I, I think that's, that's fantastic sort of old school uh, chicanery, if you will. Old, old time chicanery. I like old time chicanery. Don't you worry. Talk- someone's still arguing about shot clocks, and it's the hey. guy on the, the chat with us here. You, you got to know what's right. You got to do these. And I don't understand. Anyway, I don't get See? me off on this tangent. Don't get me <laughs> off on this tangent. I want to go. I want to go further on this tangent, though, because, Greg, you talk about shot clock and Kitchener, fellow broadcaster, maybe, you know, chirping him a little bit. I recall I recall a story that's along the lines of as the officials were coming off the ice. There's a very passionate Greg Brady up in the broadcast booth. And again, we've talked about your authenticity. You put it all out there. You don't pull punches. Wasn't there something about as the officials were coming off the ice, they would never be officiating another game in that league again, as per Greg Brady. Come on. I, it's that's not the quote. I'm, I cannot believe because I didn't send send this to you in advance. So you either remember the story or someone's uh, someone's working behind the scenes uh, heavily in your research department. <laughs> I think I yelled and I think it was at Sean Reed. Um because Joe Park didn't do that many games in Saginaw. <laughs> I was going to bring up that name anyway. <laughs> we're going we're to go worst worst OHL dining experiences and worst OHL referees. But I think I think Sean, <laughs> Sean was coming off the ice, and I think well, uh, yeah, I I do think I was still on the air. I screamed out, "Don't ever come back here!" I I'm not, it's not a proud moment. Uh, it's a spontaneous moment. It wasn't in the script to tell uh, a referee and two linesmen uh, or two referees and two linesmen to never come back. 
Um, but also Saginaw, your voice would carry. You guys would know Owen Sound. If you like, you can hear the play by play, like the lines. I, I look up and I go, uh, offside blown clearly, clearly not an offside. And then the linesman would glance up and like shrug his shoulders at you. <laughs> like you, you're, you've got those, um, the two, you're like the two old guys in the Muppets, except the, the people on the stage, you're, you're Stadler and Waldorf all rolled into one, but the linesman can hear you. And so they're looking up going, buddy, come on. You know, I'm getting as much as you are for this game. What are we doing? I'm right with you. Owen sounds probably the worst because you're right on top of them. When you first got into broadcasting, when you first went to Saginaw, you said that you followed the league in London and whatnot. But do you remember your first game broadcasting in the OHL? Not really. I, I think we played Sarnia um, on a Saturday night. I don't. I, I I remember the first playoff games against Guelph. We got swept by Guelph in uh, in 05, 04, 05. And, uh, but they were just happy to be there. Uh, playoff team and uh, and and you know Guelph had Guelph had Dowdy as a 16 year old Ryan Perrin as a 19 year old another guy by the way I thought would be a phenomenal NHL defenseman like like a stay at home defensive defenseman um, like a Mark Stahl like I almost think Ryan Perrin I thought he'd have the career Mark Stahl had to be perfectly yeah. honest they were drafted around the same place in different years anyway no I I don't Chris it's weird but I but I remember the first time the first time you're in each building is like that. And the first time you're doing game in London, the odd, the odd, I don't even need to tell you like what it means to, to step into the odd. I'd never seen a game there as a fan. And so to go in there and I'm sure the, the O two O three team uh, was, was deep. I want to say that's, that's gotta be a younger year for, for Mike Richards. It's gotta be a younger year. Um, I think Eminger was on that team, then went to the world juniors and then came back uh, from the world juniors. And we were in there in early, in early January, but but those were the, the three buildings that were by far, yeah, the toughest to win in. When, when you could win in London, win in Kitchener, which we I don't think we won a game in Kitchener until maybe my fourth year broadcasting. So we would have gone 0 and 8 or 0 7 and 1 or something like that. Um, and then remember Windsor, until I really got to Windsor, Windsor was kind of a was kind of a punching bag. They were very, very inconsistent in the Western Conference. When Sarnia was one of the the better teams. What I think about now when you bring that up, Chris, is that Sarnia team had, you, you didn't know then what you know now. You'd see them eight times a year in that division and six times a year. We played the Sioux and Plymouth eight times. And when you think about the dysfunction and the bullying culture, I think about that a lot, the bullying culture and Jeff Perry coaching because Carcillo's on that team. Um, uh, Ryan Muntz is on that team who's documented some bullying. Danny Fritchie is on that team. Uh, who played for Team USA in the World Juniors uh, and then went to the Knights for that remarkable, uh, you know, 05 Memorial Cup run. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think about that a lot is sort of, I never, it's, it's, a, it's the weirdest thing. I'm sure guys ask you guys this all the time, so I'll, I'll save you the question. I just never saw any of it. I heard, I heard jokes that I'm like, you know, you shouldn't say that, but it's not for me to tell you not to. Um, uh, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing racist and nothing homophobic, but just jokes that aren't, you know, uh, aren't appropriate and weren't in 2002 and they sure as hell aren't now, but I never saw it. I never saw kids uh, who I thought were, were getting maligned too much or bullied or uh, initiated, if you will. Cause when we played hockey, we we're like, that's what you were worried about when you're 12 and 13 is, are they throwing me in the shower with my clothes on? Are they, you know, am I getting my head shaved? And, uh, but you know, the, the stuff that the, the Sarnia stuff was to read about it and to hear about it. And I've gotten to know Carcillo a little bit. Um, and I know people have said, well, come on, you know, look, look what you were on the ice. You were hurting guys, ending guys' careers. If we're not going to let people, you know, have some, have some degree of take accountability for your past actions and evolve, we're in big trouble. Like we see this politically. Well, you said this six years ago. Yeah. And then I realized that was wrong. And now I'm on the, I'm on the right side of an issue. Like, Daniel Carcillo has done, uh, you know, a lot of incredible um, in, in that department. Akeem Alou has as well, a guy who a lot of teammates had problems with Alou. And, and I understood it. They wanted him to work harder. They wanted him to care more. And I also understood some of the discrimination that he was facing. But it's a, it's a double-edged sword sometimes. It's, it's funny you mention that because I, I think that's an important thing to get out there about, about Sarnia in that first year because – my, my recollection too about the first year is just how great the league was because we were walking into um, that 2000, that, that big 2005 three draft, if you will, 
um, that is just Eric Stahl, Nathan Horton, Jeff Carter. Jeff Carter, I thought, was the best player in the league my first year. And it was it shocked me he went – he probably went 14th, 15th to the – to the Flyers, that was the year they were able to draft Carter and Richards. I got Jeff Carter going 11th overall. Oh, my God, behind, like, the Nikolai Zherdevs and Milan Mahalik's Nice. Mahalik's a nice player, but Carter going 11's nuts. Guys, Corey Perry going 28th seems borderline crazy now, but there were a lot of people that thought Corey Perry's act just wouldn't play in the NHL, and they ignored him. You and I had a, a couple of spirited debates in our time together on the radio, Greg, about Hall versus Sagan. And you would have seen Taylor Hall. Hall and Ellis might, have, might as well have been Hall and Oates the way they went together in Windsor there. But your first impressions of this guy that obviously has translated his game to the pros. Taylor Hall uh, was a remarkable, remarkable 16-year-old. Um, rookies, we had we had a tight enough bus uh, that, you know, they, they were, they, I got my own seat, which was great. I didn't always get my own seat in Saginaw. Um, so I got my own seat, but I felt bad about that once the numbers started piling up because in the, in the seat right behind me are Taylor Hall and Ryan Ellis, and I'm going... <laughs> You know, like you guys deserve, you guys deserve your own bus, uh, the way you're, <laughs> you're carrying this team at times as 16 year olds, you should go via limo. Like this should be like a band that gets so big. You got five different, uh, five different limos to the gigs. Yeah. Taylor scored. I'm, I, I think two, three weeks into the season, we had, uh, we had a Friday night game in, in London when he got, he got a game winner. Um, and, and then the next night in Erie, he had a four goal game and, it was remarkable. And, you know, Warren Reichel would be in the press box, the general manager who is uh, animated as a personality <laughs> when, when the game's going on. So Taylor Hall wore number four. So you could see him like, like when Hall wouldn't go out for a power play or even, I think we were in a, a shoot. I think the London game the night before might've been a shootout. So he's in the, then John Labatt center press box. Um, where you should be able to hear from the Windsor bench. And I saw, I saw Bob Bugner look up and Reichel's just screaming at as long as he's holding up the, he's going four, four. Like if you don't put Taylor Hall in this shootout, we're throwing down on the bus <laughs> after the game. But Mike, you're right. It's, it's, um, I feel like I'll diminish, Ty, you know, Tyler Sagan by saying, I didn't know if he'd be a phenomenal uh, pro hockey player. I really didn't. And then how it started in Boston maybe gave you the sense that I remember, I remember when Jordan Stahl got drafted in the top three and I'm like, I didn't see that either. Like he got drafted really high by Peterborough, but I guess I was, I was probably comparing him to Eric way too much. Cause, cause he's not Eric. And I don't think he was ever supposed to be a number one. He fits great as a guy that can play behind Crosby and Malkin and, and obviously had skill, but th th those are some of the fun debates about it was, uh, was, was watching Taylor as a 16 year old, um, you know, uh, Mickey Reno is our captain. I know we're going to talk about him. Josh Bailey was an 18 year old who they'd gotten from Owen sound uh, trading, probably a veteran player or two at the time to get a younger player because Windsor had to do exactly what Saginaw did when they bought the team, they realized it was a mess and they kind of had to go down and take their lumps. They like, they took beatings for the first two years trading veteran players but also acquiring draft capital um so they could you know it, and you know you you, you gotta finish first uh, you gotta finish uh 20th to to draft uh taylor hall i think he was second behind ryan o'reilly though you guys might remember that better i think erie yeah, took o'reilly right. and yeah. windsor took hall second overall in the uh, priority selection you mentioned mickey how tough was that scenario <sighs> um well, I'll tell you how I found out, um, because by then in my, uh, evolution, it's, it's, it was, it says I, I've been really lucky in that. I don't feel, you know, I've had pets die, but I still have my parents. Uh, I haven't had a lot of bad news that has just floored me. And, and usually, like I said, e even, you know, even some of the career stuff, there's not, there's not a thing that's happened in my career that I'd say like that I, I ended up taking personally and, you know, couldn't say, well, let's, let's see, instead of adversity here, let's see an opportunity. And, uh, and it, it, Mickey was different. And uh, I found out Sunday, we'd had a game in Owen Sound uh, of that weekend. This is probably right around middle of February, around this time of year. And this is 2008. 
So here's what I've done. I've already moved up to Toronto and I'm doing the water show four to seven on the station I'm on now on, uh, on AM 640 in Toronto. So my wife's living in Livonia with a uh, rather rambunctious two-year-old and she's seven months pregnant. So hope you don't mind shoveling the driveway uh, every day uh, and whatnot in the winter. So I would try and come home on weekends. And I remember that weekend I did because I'm working a full a straight shop Monday to Friday, four to seven. So there were some, this is, I'm realizing two things, Chris. One, I probably can't do this. I probably can only do the spits this one year. And I, and when I'd negotiated a deal with 640, um, I, you know, they, they wanted me to give the spits up right away. And I don't blame them for asking that. And I said, this is too important to me. Um, I love doing it. I just came to that organization. I can't, you know, circumstances have changed in my life where I need to leave Detroit for my career to go to Toronto. And again, um, I hated leaving the Detroit show, but uh, was it better for me in the long term? Yes. Or, you know, has our, have our lives been better where we are now than where we were maybe by a little bit? Yeah. So it all, that stuff was working out, but I didn't want to leave the spits in the middle of the year. So I'm taking, I'm home Friday night. I probably, you know, couldn't do, I probably couldn't do a home Thursday night game. And Steve Bell, I had an interesting scenario that year. Steve Bell would do the um, home play-by-play and I would do the color at home. And that was the arrangement from the start of the year. But AM 800 didn't want him missing games, missing morning shows. So they didn't want him on the road at all. And so I would do road solo play by play, which I liked. But I also loved, uh, you know, uh, Beller's a gregarious guy. It was always great to me in the, in the months that I was in, in Windsor. Again, knew I wouldn't stay terribly long. But uh, Steve was awesome to me. We golfed a couple of times. Super guy. And, uh, and, and Mike, one of the, you know, one of the least homerific people in the league. I mean, where the hell should I start? Like, <laughs> yeah, doesn't... just calls it straight down the middle. Steve Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yeah. He sure does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so the idea of, of doing games with Steve was a kick. I think I also thought, Chris, it's interesting because I'd done the six years in Saginaw and, you know, I, I probably realized doing color might, you know, might ease off some of the prep and some of the exhaustion um, of doing play by play. I think I thought that too. And, um, and so I was going to do that for the one year and then sort of, well, and I signed a, a kind of a two-year contract with the Spitz, but only could fulfill the one year. But that Friday, I'm coming home and I get to spend Saturday with my kid. And mm-hmm. then I think Sunday, I drive to Windsor. We're in Owen Sound, but, but I take a train from, I take, I take Via from Windsor to Kitchener. We played in Kitchener the night before. That must have also been a game I couldn't do. And we're going to Owen Sound on the Sunday. And I see Mickey Renault in the lobby Sunday morning. He's the first player I see. And uh, again, looks as healthy as a horse. He's headed to breakfast. I get there right around. I, I took like a 6 a.m. train. I get there around the time we're going to have breakfast and then go over to, um, over to the Owen Sound Arena. He gets the game winner in that game. Um, I... I, how did I get home? I took the bus back to Windsor with the team and my car is at Windsor, uh, at Windsor arena. Cause I took a cab, uh, to via rail and then took the train up to meet the team. So I was, it's very plain trains and automobiles. Once I was living in Toronto working for Windsor, as you might imagine. So, um, I'm driving in, mm, I'm driving into Toronto from Detroit for a four o'clock afternoon show on Monday. I hear Catherine Jate who we know, Mike, right, at 680 News, phenomenal uh, news anchor. She's at 640 then. Um, she's wonderful. And I hear her say, um, coming up in sports, uh, an OHL captain has died. I- I'm going, you know, I wonder who it is, because I know it's not Mickey Renault. I literally said that to myself alone in the car. I'm just coming into Toronto. It's probably, it's probably 3 o'clock. And uh, I'm going to get there about 3.15 and we're going to go on the air at four o'clock. So I got about a minute and a half and I'm, my, I'm, I'm racking my brain. I'm like, it's not the guy I saw yesterday in the lobby who got the game winning goal against the Owen Sound attack, but it is. And she comes on the air and that's as close as I've been. No, you know, no word of a lie to, to crashing my car, like to not being able to drive the car properly shaking 
And it's the worst news I've ever got suddenly. And, you know, again, is that good? Um, I suppose, but was it devastating at the time? And then to go on the air and I'm feeling it right now. Like I'm feeling how I felt at four o'clock when Waters and I got to go on the air. And he even spotted me and, and was like, well, you know, you look like, uh, you look like you've seen a ghost. So it was incredibly difficult. I couldn't get back um, to Windsor until Thursday. And they, they sort of had a wake for him on Thursday. And seeing, I saw DJ Smith was the first guy I saw at, at the bar that night where people had gone to the wake and then they were out afterwards. And I just, he and I just both burst into tears. Like it was the saddest look I've ever seen an adult male have. And I lost my shit there as well. And um, that year was like, never, uh, it never felt normal again. We lost in the playoffs to Sarnia to, to like those Stamkos is last year, right? He's going to get drafted first overall and good, good Sarnia team. They have Matt Martin on that team <laughs> causing trouble and driving people crazy, but it took a, a lot of years, a lot of years to really get over, um, to get over that, that happening. And, and it was, it was just jarring. And, and I, I know for you guys probably spotted it too. It just, it jarred everybody in the entire league for you know weeks and months on end and i felt so out of sorts anyway because i'm living in two different places and and you know watching his fa his dad mark had played and and you know th there was just such an impact on the community and it tells you what these teams mean in these communities it tells you so distinctly what 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 it means that these guys come kind of come in and out of your lives and they only play they're not nhl players they're not going to play there a decade they're not going to mean what or professional sports. They're not going to mean what Steven Gerrard does to Liverpool, right? Or, or uh, Wayne Rooney does to Manchester. It's, it's just such a short period of time. You have these players. And to lose a kid like Mickey, who was just a born leader, so obvious that he should have been captain. Um, and, the, and to see kids like just, they would cry out of nowhere. Like kids who you just think are as tough as nails would just, you know, they burst into tears, like randomly the rest of the season. That's what I remember. The last uh, the last two months of that year being like it's absolutely incredible the impact and it speaks to I guess really in, in many ways Greg how close we become to the teams that we cover right there's not to mention the, not not to just speak of the access that we have and the bus trips that we're taking but there is definitely that connection that develops between those of us who broadcast the games and the characters and players that make the game up. Yeah, it's it's every bit of that, Mike. It's everything you just said right there. So it's uh, it it was a terrible, terrible thing, and uh, I don't know that there's been a tragedy quite like it in the OH. I mean, the Terry Trafford story. I feel like you and I were you and I working together when that happened, or was yeah, that we soon were. afterwards? No, that was. I I think we were. I think we still were. I, I, it was, yeah. and that was really think, knowing Saginaw as I know, and knowing how sort of you know family based they are. Um, and I, I don't know whether something sort of fell through the cracks there. And, and you know, we're, we're, we're so much more aware of mental health than we were six, seven years ago. But as we were, as, a, as when Chris asked me that earlier about sort of the Sarnia thing, like you're, you're so much more conscious of trying to spot things now. Do I, look, do I think we, are we, I think we overdiagnose things sometimes. I think we overmedicate things sometimes. And I worry about that, especially as a parent. I go, you know what? Sometimes life is really shitty and really hard and you just got to push through it. So I, you know, I, I don't want to go to somebody when I'm having a rough go as an adult and think, uh, oh, there's no end in sight to this. The pandemic has exacerbated that to where we're all wondering, like, when will I feel normal again? But, but I worry sometimes that we're, you know, we're worried. We over worry about kids when just being a teenager has a tremendous, tremendous set of ups and downs. But the Terry Trafford thing was like, I don't know how that fell through the cracks. I, I think there's so much there that maybe a lot of people would do differently, given that they didn't know that he got back in time, that they didn't they couldn't find him for the longest period of time, um, that there just should have been, you know, like uh, it, it's tricky. It, it's a it was a very I remember it being a very difficult thing to talk about and sort of we all would want to point fingers and say, well, did this person do something wrong? Like, no, you know, you can't blame the spirit. If the spirit want to cut a player, they want to cut a player. But, but where did everything go in terms of the process after that to make sure that kid got from point A to point B safely? It, it just looked like they didn't know where he was for two or three days.
Yeah, the Trafford thing was just terrible all around. And you were talking about the Mickey, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Mickey situation. I still make a point of every time we go to Windsor to mention on the broadcast that I think it's one of the classiest things in the league that over a decade later, the Windsor Spitfires still have his 18 behind each net yeah. and the things they do for that, that uh, what or Mickey and what he meant to that organization. I think it's just extremely classy on the Spitfires organization that they continue to remember Mickey the way that obviously they do. And everyone around that team at the time did now turning a corner to a little bit more of a lighter thing. You mentioned earlier um, about, all the miles and kilometers put on OHL buses. How did you sleep on an OHL bus race? Uh, with my feet in the air uh, up against the window. Um... Oh, but you had your own seat. That's why I got the short guy next to me. Yeah. The idea that you'd end up, the idea, Chris, that you'd end up in some form of a uh, John Candy, Steve Martin scenario was enough for me to be really cautious about, uh, about sleeping with one eye open. Like you right. weren't like, you know, you, you weren't quite uh, in a those aren't pillows scenario, but you just never knew. <laughs> you, you never knew. So, yeah, if I'm able to stretch out, like Jim Parker, who writes for the Windsor Star, would ride the bus, too. Uh, and uh, and he but he 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 like he took a he, uh, yeah, he took a picture of me with an actual camera once where I'm sort of halfway like my feet are up on the like on the left side of the bus, let's say. Yeah. And my feet are up above the glass on the bus like above the window and like are like like ver totally vertical in the air and i could get like i could get three hours that way and as we said like it, it is the, there were even this even just the hotel sleep is not healthy like there was one trip we went it was barry sudbury Sault Ste. marie and we were we were thursday night in barry we were friday night in sudbury but then we were overnight in sudbury and then not not Sunday Sunday at six p.m. in the Sioux. So you had from the time <laughs> you had from the time the Friday game ended in Sudbury at ten o'clock until like noon. You, you were going to spend the next thirty four hours in Sudbury in the middle of January. I remember be, I remember having a sore throat, and I tried to go to the pharmacy in downtown Sudbury. It closed on a Saturday at three p.m. <laughs> <laughs> in two thousand and three what kind of a like you know it felt like you were in the 50s like like is there a you know a chemist can i go to his house can he brew something up for me like it was uh and so you you just you'd sleep some of the time away in the uh in the afternoons as you guys know and this whole hockey culture of the afternoon nap it it inflicts it inflicts itself on the broadcasters as well to where and remember also i'm doing i'm doing a show where i'm getting four and a half five hours of sleep a night um, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, so sleeping on buses was really easy. Had I had a normal life and normal sleep patterns, maybe you're wide awake on the buses, but, but I'm, I'm encouraged now because you guys were telling me before we started recording that now it's not like an airplane where they used to just, here's your movie. And it's, uh, you know, national lampoons van wilder. And you're like, Oh Christ, like, this is terrible. I've seen this three times all on the bus, but everybody watches their own stuff. And that's, that's so comforting to me. And uh, it was it was what I would have wanted for years and years on end of riding the bus is just not not having movies inflicted upon me. That said, this is the very first time I watched The Departed was on the bus, so they got one right. Like it wasn't yeah. just all you know '80s sex comedies and uh, and and uh, I know Ryan Reynolds is a big hero now, but but he's made some bad movies. I'm gonna tell you, Van Wilder's one of them. Come on, Van Wilder's a Sunday afternoon classic. Can't go I with the, can't go with the Van Wilder. <laughs> I still miss it. It's still a little jarring for me how quiet it is. I didn't love the movies being forced on us either. And there was the one year it it ha it was double digits. We watched Step Brothers. It seemed like every other road trip it was Step Brothers. So but I, I kind of still miss the the noise and the and the buzz. The, the quiet sometimes <laughs> gets to me. I'm not used to it yet. Well, I introduced there's two things I think about when you say that I introduced young blood to the Saginaw Spirit bus. And well I'm done. happy that I did that. And yeah, great uh, choice. whether whether it was, you know, um, w whether it was, you know, the idea that we were trying to figure out who the worst actual skater is, Rob Lowe or Patrick Swayze, <laughs> or whether it's the nudity involving Cynthia Gibb. Either way, the players took to it. And I, you know, I'm proud of that, uh, that I sold them, that Youngblood was good. Like, I don't know how they hadn't seen it before, to be perfectly honest, but this is, you know, 80, this is 2003, and that movie's out in 86. 
The other thing I think about is uh, there was one player on Saginaw who um, whose parents seemed to have a lot of money and I'd catch him uh, like this is before our phones had everything on it. And he would go down to the office area at hotels and he'd be playing video poker like for real money, like for lots of money, like more than an OHL player gets during the week. And I, I, I know you guys don't want to reveal state secrets, but I got to imagine now with the proliferation of sports gambling and like, like we might be creating some real Yarmar Yagers in the OHL. Like guys, this, <laughs> like a Sunday afternoon game, they're like, they're on their phone in the intermission, hoping the coach doesn't come in and go, my God, I, you know, I, 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 I've got to hit the over on this Panthers Falcons game. It's far. Well, that has to happen. Come on. State secrets, Greg. Straight I know. State it's, secrets. <laughs> I'm sure somewhere it does. I'm not going to, for sure. I, yeah, I, I love those stories about Yager, like checking in it, like like calling NFL, calling bookies about NFL games during, like he hated playing Sunday afternoon games because he wanted to bet on the NFL. I think Darren McCarty was the very same way in Detroit. I have loved every one of these stories, not just from the league, but from your career here, Greg. And honestly, I could listen to them again and again. The only thing I think we need to establish before we let you go is, will you return to the great league that is the Ontario Hockey League <laughs> when Dick Carver has a Greg, my, my uproarious laughter. <laughs> <laughs> when there is a Greg Brady night at the Dow. I mean, come on, we've had Jan Mersak. We've had Magic Johnson come out after the games to talk to play, fans. We've, we've had the, the winners of the weekend fishing derby announced. It's time for a Greg Brady night at the Dow. Let's do it. Let me tell you something about the Saginaw Spirit uh, game day operations and their staff. By the way, I got to play in one game. So this, this Belleville was coming in with George Burnett uh, running the team. Now you're going to oh, start because you're like, yeah. yeah, you're like, oh, what a gregarious, uh, open-minded, uh, you know. Easy to get along with. Yeah, yeah, fly by the seat of your pants type individual. Like Real laid back. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, the guy makes Bill Belichick look like Sean McVay. Yeah. But great. <laughs> so, so we have a game before the Belleville game, which is still scheduled to start at 7-11. It's like the local police and firefighters. And what Craig Goslin uh, has me do, like the, the wizard of game day operations, is uh, he's got, like, Mike, do you know his, his nickname is Goose? Have you heard yes. that before? Does that have. come across your wavelength? It has. Okay, <laughs> okay so Goose. Goose has me uh, playing in the game with the Red Wings alumni, which is great. And uh, when I can actually still play, but also on the bench, there's a wireless microphone doing interviews with the players. Like when I get back to the bench. So my defense partner is Joey Koser. That's amazing. Awesome. I'm passing the puck back and forth with Joey Koser. But uh, the game go goes along. and But late in that game, the somebody breaks the glass with a shot. And they are not ready for this. And you guys, I'm sure, have been at many – when you have a delay at an OHL rink with broken glass, it's not like the NHL where there's like it's nine guys all ready to go coming out of the woodwork. Here's the new glass. We're going to, there's going to be like a three minute break here. It was a lot longer than three. So that game, honestly, like the mood George Burnett was in when that game started around like eight Oh six PM. And they probably had to go play like in the Sioux the next day, or you should have like, Honestly, the anger, uh, I, I could feel George Burnett seething from the Bulls bench uh, un underneath me. Uh, I, I just, so that, that was, you know, get, get, but when you've got, when you guys have gone to Saginaw, honestly, they pledge a 7-11 start time. I've Never. documented this. The average start is 7:27. just because of promotional events. There's, there's livestock. They have to get off the ice. There's, <laughs> <laughs> there's other things. By the way, I mentioned, I, I'm going to tell this story. The one night they had a, uh, Hooters was a sponsor. I, like, st like, stop me right there. Like, like you know, to quote no. Morrissey, stop me if you think you've heard this one before. We're not stopping you. No, Hooters <laughs> is sponsoring an intermission feature with a, uh, it's a skate, it's a race with, um, it's a race of three uh, Hooters um waitresses i think maybe some hostesses were involved uh, also mike i can't tell the difference and uh and the idea is like if if this one wins um it's a little like when the coffee and the donut and the bagel race at uh at comerica park or whatever was that at comerica park i can't remember so 
if if this one girl, if if Jessica wins, then section you know these sections get like I don't know ten dollars off their next meal at Hooters because that's good family fun right after the game. <laughs> and um, the outfits and the um, motion of the body, <laughs> in, like the the how would I put it, the ratio of speed versus uh, cleavage during the skate race and I remember where you are guys are broadcasting from you got an upper view like you're looking down you don't want to look down but you're looking down and uh it's a little like flicking across the television you're like you know like what's the, oh the wkrp there's lonnie anderson like that's for our older demographic but either way great reference yeah but that was that was one that's the only one and done promotional event ever in saginaw spirit history that they tried that and then they probably went to hooters and they're like is not, you know, we, we got a lot of really happy 14 year old male fans. <laughs> we got a lot of concerned 50 year old female and male fans that yeah. this promotion isn't, you know, we're not talking, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna be paying extra penance at, at the at chapel the next day, I feel like. That promo had a lot of spirit. So so in Saginaw, they uh so so you're right that like the idea of coming back for a ceremony, I don't want to delay the 7 Eleven start time like, anymore. <laughs> Or or the inter or and the intermissions. I don't want like a thirty eight year like you know it would take as long as like Steve Eiserman getting in. You'd have to ask all the fans to get there at five p.m. with all the things. Like look how long this has been for me to come back. And and yes, as we documented, it is not you know it's not it's not the most humbling thing when you know they eventually find Joey, but it takes like you know six guys and five five years to find a, a replacement for the for the original Saginaw Spirit broadcaster. It's not, by the way, who's got a worse playoff? I, I saw two playoff games, one in six years. Can you guys, honestly, what's a, what's a worse ratio than that for playoff wins for an OHL broadcaster compared to years put in? There's no comparison, nothing. I don't know. I think someone in Sarnia has to have you. Beat. I <laughs> Terry Doyle. I don't think. To, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, I don't she's been there too long. No, he might be, you're right. You might've set the low bar for lack I, of success. And then the next year, the next year, I'm like, okay, they, uh, they, they bring in Mike Miller, right? From the States to do the Spitfires games. Presto, two Memorial Cup wins. And you're sitting in Toronto on, like, doing radio. At 40 bucks a game? Think about what that, what that would have meant for me financially. <laughs> <laughs> much more than that, much higher bar. So I'm willing, yeah, I'd be willing to come back. But you're right. They've uh, there's some big names. I mean, now, and now what? Chris Osgood owns part of the Spirit, right? And yep. uh, Jimmy not, D. There, an, another ex Red Wing is there? Jimmy Devolano. Jimmy Devolano <laughs> owns part of the Red Wings. So uh, I don't know. By the way, the Spirit were bought for two million dollars American, which was three million dollars at the time. You guys remember when the exchange rate was like a buck US was like a buck fifty eight Canadian, like. You, honestly, you'd, you'd get, uh, when I'd come back across the border and cash in like 80 bucks American, it was like wearing a ski mask. It was great. <laughs> That's how it goes. Uh, so great. Mike, I'm, I, I never say never. I love the league. Uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, I, I've, by the way, I love what you guys have done with the podcast. You've got players, you've got broadcasters, you got, I thought the Jeff Tui episode was great. Like I watch and uh you know post pandemic uh you know i'll i'll be able to and and when it's not january you know i'm not saying i'll watch less but but there will be outside things to do <laughs> that's fair i want to get uh, maybe on another episode or something i want to get some tips on how you dealt with farwell and your own tardiness because i never hear the end of my own tardiness so i'd like to know some tips on how to deal with mike and let's say his temperament when mm. you are tardy Chris, there was a huge push. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I really wanted to downplay and I think I did a good job of it. The 80 miles each way I had to drive for home games during a 68 games. Now I, I did it. I did ask them. I said, you got it. When we have a Friday, Saturday scenario, like Friday, 7 PM, Saturday, 7 PM or 826. Like I mentioned, if there's like a, like a <laughs> ceremony involving uh, farm animals or Hooters waitresses, never at the same time. They never combine those two, which I thought was important. <laughs> But I, but I said, you got to let me stay over. But then I think once I started having a kid, that was too much time to be away. But it was great to sleep over in Saginaw, wake up on Saturday, have nothing to do. You go to Birch Run, go to the outlet mall, you buy some shoes and some, uh, you know, dress shirts and whatnot. It was great. 
but yeah, the, uh, the, the idea of, um, what were we talking about? What did you? <laughs> oh, I meant when you were working with Farwell at the fan, oh. your tardiness, how did you deal with his temperament? His temperament was, he was always quite calm. I loved hearing oh. him and Lang start the show. Um, <laughs> The best. He's one third of the show. He's yeah. listening to the other two thirds start the show without him. That's yeah. how it works some days. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like when your boss, your program director says, well, I'm taking a listening day. And I'm like, oh, you're going golfing. You're, yeah. A listening day means you've got a tea time or a hot date or something like that. So, but the fact that Mike for, I think Mike and I did the show together. See, it's really great because I'm going to tell you something, Chris. Mike, Don Collins said to me, he's building the station. And I'd started doing mornings early in 2011. And I think the show was starting to go well. And Dan Dunleavy was leaving because Dan was our update guy. And he goes, I want you to have a coffee with Mike. And God damn it. Did you not come all the way in from Kitchener just to have a coffee with me for an hour? And maybe you saw Don, right? That's how we met, right? That's exactly how we met. Yeah. But just, just the idea of it, like, almost like if you get really bad vibes from this guy, like he's killed people before or, <laughs> or you're not... Just the idea, because uh, my God, is there anything in radio like uh, Mike? The the idea of a forced um, marriage in radio is worse than a forced marriage in real life. I really think, because <laughs> there's there's forced marriages involved, like it, over time where dowries are involved, but you don't have to spend fifteen hours a week talking to that person if you don't want to. You can go to a yeah, forced radio marriage. You can't get away. You can't Especially a mornings one. That's right. Those are even worse. One. Not that I'm. Yeah. So I loved. I loved working with uh, with Jim and you. Um, I never. I, I. I don't think I had as much fun after you left. I don't think that because you're you're a quality person and character means a lot to me. But but Don Don Chris Don. My point was Don was asking Mike putting the pedal down on him to move from Kitchener, wasn't he? He really yeah, wanted he you to be in the GTA and to be on the show. And I still, I think long-term you probably, again, like, like I, I don't regret a single move I've made or decision. I, I think you probably did the right thing, but it must've been tempting, right? Live in Toronto, go here, go there, go to these concerts, go to the, like you must've thought about it. Oh, absolutely. And, and really the, one of the main reasons, cause I still could have, unlike you, when it was Toronto and Windsor, I still could have done some Kitchener Absolutely. OHL work, oh, right? mornings you could have done all the games at night. Absolutely, you could have. But that cheapskate Don Collins wasn't willing to, you know, pay the necessary increase for me to afford the rates in the GTA. Well, so well, that Jim was Sal Jim's salary was really well. That's true. Uh, yeah, he was. <laughs> he was the like, anchor you know, weighing us down. No oh, wonder Lang loved David here. Clarkson so much. He had the same kind of contract. <laughs> I, <don't... laughs> I still remember that too. Honestly, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to rehash many of the uh, disagreements we. <laughs> over the years because oh i was hard on the clark this is gonna be the best deal ever and you put me in my you were absolutely right by the way on that i one. think i was but i think i was at the cottage when that happened so i think i had i had simmered first of all i was angry that mikhail grabowski was because we would have been on the morning after the leafs 4-1 chris wouldn't know this we were on the morning after the leafs had the 4-1 lead in boston yeah and like lang's oh lang's a love like he i love that guy he loved the leafs so much he was devastated he could barely speak <laughs> remember after game five Dion Phaneuf makes that pinch and he wants to he wants to cut Dion Phaneuf in the offseason. We're like, it doesn't work that way. I know you're angry. Phaneuf pinched on like David Krejci. And, uh, and then, but then we didn't expect him to win game six or be up in game seven. And Collins called me, by the way. So this is where you can pin the blame. Um, Collins called me when it was like 4-1 Leafs. And he's like, okay, um, Leafs Rangers, next round. Um, you oh, know, DK. Got to talk about whether, uh, you know, do we want to take the show on the road? Do we oh. do this? Do we do that? Uh, should we be, you know, and I'm like, they just scored again, Don. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, by the time that conversation was done, it was tied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was tied. Well, and I didn't like that Grabowski was uh, Grabowski was blamed for a lot. You know, I was not a big Randy Carlyle fan, Mike. I don't know if you recall. I, I do recall that. Yes, I do. And uh, my biggest, this is, uh, Chris, my biggest uh, memory of, of, I was wrong so often. Like, like Farwell was the, always the voice of reason. Lang was heavily emotional. By the way, I'm going to say this. We are Scott Moore's all-time favorite fan morning show. We are. Wow. I'm, I'm a Scott Moore fan. That's huge Who to isn't? hear. It's, honestly, yeah. he is. So that's that's a lot of people, of course, great legendary broadcasters, right? Your John Derringers, Pat Marston, uh, Stelic was on there a lot. That meant, that meant a lot to me finding that out. I think he's right. Um, <laughs> not to speak ill of, of the living. <laughs> 
but I think that was the best show uh, is the show I had the most fun on. So the, um, uh, but, but the R.A. Dickey trade happens, Chris. And I'm telling you, I walk in and I'm like, geez, I just, the Blue Jays, I, what is the, he's got a knuckleball, but the, you know, he's 38 and this seems like a fluky year. And these guys, remember, they trade Travis Darno and Noah, Noah Syndergaard. Syndergaard. And, and I come in and Lang and Farwell are like, high five. Wow. Da, 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 da. And this was even before the Jays made the, um, the Jose Reyes trade where everybody said the league should ban the trade. Like it's, it's so one-sided that they got Josh Johnson. Um, <laughs> although Mark Burley was like throw it in and it was like, Oh, you got, you got Burley's crappy contract, but he was good for the Jays for a couple of years. But you guys were on the Dickey thing and you were like, there's no way the Jays can lose this trade. And I'm like, Cindergaard was just really God, pretty awesome. Maybe yeah. it's not as awesome anymore. Maybe but not. but I thought Travis Darno was going to turn into Mike Piazza, and I'm wrong about that. I was dead wrong. Injuries, right? But Travis Darno was going to be really something. Syndergaard was the best of what what they call him, the Lansing Three. He ended up yeah. having the, the biggest upside. Yeah, a lot of those guys, like like Strowman, kind of. I think people forget Strowman kind of came out of nowhere. Strowman didn't have yeah. Syndergaard's hype. He didn't have Jeff Hoffman's hype. Like all the people have documented this. Steve Simmons does a really good job documenting this. That none of the guys they really moved in fifteen anywhere like to get david price to get troy tulowitzki to get none of them really like this isn't like Echeveria. a Smoltz, doyle alexander or a jeff kent david cone where you're yeah. watching a guy going god he was our there's nobody that jet now i don't know whether that speaks to their how they were drafting at the time or whatnot but there's nobody that's really burned the jays who's gone somewhere else and has just been all except cinder that's the only one that you go holy crap boy we could have you know we could have used him because dickie wasn't even on the God, I was at the 15 playoff game when uh, Dickie lasted about an inning and a third against the Royals. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about you, Farzy. I'm, I'm sure really you did. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Oh, Greg, it's too much fun. It really is. We still think about you all the time. When we're out there on the road, walking across catwalks and remembering the, uh, the years that you spent. And I'm going to remember that distinction, that dubious distinction. Two playoff wins in six years. Okay. Really something. The Very Brady proud. curse from now on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, and Stubbs, you can imagine, like for my guy Stubbs, 360 to go 363 and two, and then be like on the best, calling the best junior team game, uh, junior team ever's games 10 years later, uh, beating Ramuski in the, in the Memorial Cup final. Like London beat us on a night, Mike. Uh, we came in and we had Jeff Weber. Remember him as a goalie? I do. Okay. And Mike Brown, who I mentioned earlier, again, you know, rough incident, but not a bad person. Mike Brown was going to make his rookie debut the next night. We're in there on a Friday night at the JLC. It's, it's, it's nine, nothing at the end of the second period. And, and like they, he asked, we, he called, we give up a 10th goal at the start of the third and Bob Mancini asked Weaver, he goes, are you okay staying in? because you know you don't want to put the kid in there who's going to make his ohl debut the next night and have him be target practice um for Corey perry rob shrimp and sergey kostitsa and then the like so we lose that game 12 nothing 12 nothing jeff weaver gives up all 12 goals probably on 68 shots he's probably ron tugnut except it wasn't a 3-3 tie but that gives you a sense as to the uh the dominance of the of the Mike Stubbs, who's like Kitchener's biggest rival, still London, right by a mile, hundred percent, hundred percent. Does not Windsor close. even come close? No, no, not anymore. Guelph would be the other closest. In and my Plymouth, mind. Plymouth, fifteen twenty years ago, those were, yeah. but especially when you know DeBoer yeah. Scott came over, and but yeah, it's it's really in in the Western Conference for sure. Everybody's chief rival is the London Knights. I'm Everybody. glad we ran out of time to not talk about me calling into the uh, Kitchener cable access television post game show. <laughs> when the Rangers were up on the Spitfires three, nothing in the series. <laughs> I, Mike wasn't working with me then, but I told Mike, I go, Oh, th these guys were like burying the Spitfires. I called in as Greg from Ajax. <laughs> and, uh, and I just had to have my say, I'm like, this isn't going to, I'm going to get walloped by Collins. If I'm talking about the OHL the next morning. So I'm calling us just still at 640 then. So I can't come on and 
I should have played that call because these guys are like, like, really, Greg from Ajax, tell us more about why the Spits are coming back in the series. Well, didn't uh, didn't Bob Duff find that out the hard way, too? When he wrote them, <laughs> he, he wrote off the Spits, and uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Bugner that reminded him. Of yeah, the, Bob uh, just statements. put him on a, on a yeah. coat hanger and uh, stood him up in the closet, <laughs> which is not easy to do. Uh, Greg, it's been so much fun. Thanks a million for doing this with us. Guys, loved it. Love what you've created. And uh, and again, this is when when did this start? What month? What was your first broadcast? Uh, beginning December. Of December. Yeah. yeah. We we put yeah. a bunch in the can, and uh, but yeah, first one came out in December because honestly, we were we were sitting around, well, texting back and forth a little bit, like we got to, I don't know. There's, there's a void. Friday nights aren't the same. Obviously, we should be in the midst of a season. Fans might be feeling the same thing. Let's just, uh, and this was the new idea, and, and here we are, having a keep blast do, with keep it. Keep doing it. Get, uh, you know, Mike Volucci, you got to get on. Yeah. Bob, if you need, if you, I'll, I'll, Bob Bugner, I'll get a hold of him in San Jose, although they, he probably doesn't want to come on until they, like, stop losing, which may not happen. <laughs> uh, but there's Maybe so it'll many... help him. We'll talk about all the winning he did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can, you can do that. But I love the concept and, uh, and really glad you uh, – I miss the league uh, so much. Uh, it was a great, great part of my life. And I can't wait. Look, we all can't wait to be anywhere, but I can't wait to come to the odd and, uh, and see you guys and, uh, and uh, stretch it out during an intermission. Um, not quite as long as this probably. When you do. An entire OHL game. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you do come to the odd, beers on Pope. Yeah. Beers are on us. Yeah. That feels, uh, feels reasonable. Did uh, Chris, did uh, Mike tell you the last time I saw him, I came to Kitchener specifically to see Lindsay Buckingham at, uh, at the mar- market in the square. What's that called? Center in the square. Center in the square. Center in the square. Yeah. The, and then we yeah. met at Moose after the game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Got in a couple fights. There were a couple locals yeah. that started. Uh, it was a little like a uh, Yellowstone, like that show. It started getting out of control. There were some, right. uh, some, uh, some, j- you know, uh, jibes thrown a couple different ways. And, uh, you know, uh, watching, watching Farwell glass somebody, like it's not yeah. a pretty sight. Like, were they, chir- were they chirping rush? Is that what led to it? <laughs> There's another whole podcast. Cause Greg, oh my God, he just well, what never about really... the Al- whatever happened to the Alex Lifeson, uh, promo? Like he, I, he cut that for you specifically. You I've got that saved on my desktop of my computer. I could play it right now if you want. How did we get that done? How did uh, he hum- promote the show? Humble and Fred. Oh, they got him to do it, did they? Yeah, yeah. Humble and Fred were on with us for a little segment when they were doing their just their online stuff, and they got Lifeson to cut that promo for me. I kid you not, it's on my computer right now. Chris, Mike likes me because I told him Moving Pictures is the very first album I bought, and that's true. But he has a lot of struggle with me saying that uh, Rush's Time Stand Still is their greatest song ever. But it just is. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. It's not. And it doesn't it's... work without Amy Mann from Till Tuesday. It <laughs> oh, does he's... not work without her on the record. <laughs> she makes the record. She make she stands those guys up by their bootstraps and makes them better. And this is where we take the U-turn. You see, this is where the, you know. (laughs) Get them going. Next thing you know, it's Oasis and Prince and off. We're off in a (laughs) place we don't need to be. No. All right, guys. Stay well, Greg. Awesome. Thanks, Brady. Thanks a million for this. You got it. Take care. You too.